the topic of a hearing today on Capitol Hill. A House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee heard from drug treatment counselors, psychiatrists, and government officials on new treatment programs. Subcommittee Chairman Dennis Hastert called the three-hour hearing to session. Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Affairs, and Criminal Justice uh, to order. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. I uh, apologize uh, for the delay in getting started this morning. Uh, but uh, this is an important hearing, and I appreciate your attendance. Uh, this is uh, the latest in a series of hearings on uh, drug treatment and drug testing. Today, we'll hear from two distinguished panels of experts in drug treatment, and we'll also hear uh, some uh, contrary points of view. Accountability in this area is extremely vital, and that is why we are searching as a congressional committee uh, through this hearing and other hearings for the most effective type of uh, drug treatment. We need to know exactly what works and what doesn't work. Initially, uh, let me say that we spend in excess of three billion federal tax dollars on drug treatment annually. It's an astounding amount. In that context, we hear a lot of statistics about drug treatment and its effectiveness. For that reason, the Speaker of the House and many of us in Congress have joined in a bipartisan request of the General Accounting Office to determine where federal dollars are being spent and whether those dollars, in fact, are being spent effectively. We have now received the GAO's report, and we'll hear testimony uh, about this report. In addition to GAO on the first panel, we'll also hear from Dr. Uh, Donald Vereen, General McCaffrey's deputy, uh, Dr. Marcia Lily Blanton, a drug treatment expert, Dr. Sally Sattel, a, cl a clinician uh, who will explain to us from firsthand experience how the war should be fought, Dr. Eric Wish, a researcher uh, with a broad range of experience in the community uh, of treatment scholars, will also join us, and Mr. Ray uh, Susek, president of Haymarket. He will explain drug treatment process and the role or spirituality in the recovery process. The second panel today has been assembled to explain more specific aspects of the treatment problem. Mr. Brian Hill and Mr. Arthur Pratt will discuss treatment from the perspective of correctional facilities. Dr. Douglas Lipton and, and Dr. Faye Taxman will conclude by sharing with us their expertise on treatment within the broader criminal justice system. This is an arena where there is consensus on at least one issue. No one is for addiction. This issue rises above party, about, above partisan politics, or above ideology. What we're trying to do here is to truly identify where we should channel our precious uh, and sometimes limited federal funds in an effort to successfully uh, treat addicts. Uh, if, we list, if we all listen to these witnesses with open minds, I think we can all come away with ideas that hopefully will make a big difference. <clears throat> Personally, I think this is one of the most important hearings this Congress will face because uh, drug addiction uh, and uh, the problem of uh, illegal narcotics and narcotics use uh, among our population is, has, uh, as we know, escalated. Uh, our prisons are fill, filled to brim. We have over two million people behind uh, bars. Uh, my local sheriff in a hearing that we held in my county uh, testified that 70 percent of the people behind his uh, prison walls or in state prisons that he sent uh, to our state facilities are there because of uh, drug problems or drug uh, 
crimes or drug addiction. This is an incredible problem. Uh, the other thing that personally concerns me is the addiction uh, level uh, and uh, increased drug use by our young people. And uh, there's nothing that will tear at your heartstrings more than to hear of a parent uh, who has a young son or daughter uh, who is addicted to uh, narcotics. Uh, and they've tried various treatment programs, and uh, nothing uh, succeeds. Uh, we have been fortunate in Central Florida ha to have some faith-based uh, programs that have been very successful, 90% success rate. And when we spend billions of federal tax dollars uh, on treatment programs that are not effective, we have a very serious problem. We have, and we also have uh, hundreds of thousands of parents uh, who were at wit's end uh, trying to resolve their uh, personal problems uh, uh, with the uh, youth that uh, have gone astray and they can't find treatment that works. So this indeed is a very important uh, hearing uh, for the Congress and for those parents and for the future of those uh, young people who have fallen to addiction. I'm now pleased to recognize uh, the ranking member of uh, this panel, uh, distinguished gentleman, uh, my colleague Mr. Barrett, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to our two panels of witnesses. Today's hearing will focus on the effectiveness of drug treatment programs, particularly in the criminal justice system, and the potential of treatment to combat drug abuse and all of its attendant social problems, crime, health care costs, social welfare costs, and lost productivity. In January, the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University released a comprehensive study on the relationship between drug abuse and the growing prison population in our country. According to the study, the prison population in federal and state systems has exploded over the past two decades. Between 1980 and 1996, the number of inmates in the United States more than tripled from roughly $500,000, 500,000 people to more than 1.7 million. Drug abuse accounts for the lion's share of this increase. In the state prison system, convictions for drug violations accounted for 30 percent of the increase. In the federal system, 68 percent of the increase is attributable to drug violations. The Columbia study confirmed our other research and what many of us believed intuitively, that recid recidivist offenders are most likely drug abusers. In state prisons, 41 percent of first-time offenders use drugs regularly. Compare that with two-time offenders, 63 percent of whom abuse drugs. Of those offenders who had five convictions or more, over 81 percent were regular drug users. The Columbia study concluded that our failure to provide adequate drug treatment programs in prisons was a missed opportunity to reduce crime and the myriad taxpayer costs associated with drug use. The key question today is basic. Does drug treatment work? If the answer to that question is yes, and that appears to be the consensus among healthcare professionals, social scientists, and experts in the criminal justice field, then what can we do to optimize treatment outcomes and get the biggest bang for our buck? What ingredients are necessary for a successful drug treatment program? What systems need to be in place to maximize the impact of treatment, especially in our jails and prisons? How effective are drug courts in putting these ingredients together? And what can we in Congress do to make the system better? I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses today. We also expect to be joined shortly by Representative John Conyers, the distinguished ranking Democratic member of the Judiciary Committee. He'll speak briefly about a bill that he and I introduced together in March. The purpose of this bill, which is supported by the Justice Department and the Office of National Drug Control Policy, is to free up prison construction funds and allow the states, if they choose, to spend that money on appropriate drug testing and drug treatment in the prisons. It's one important way to help break the cycle of drugs and crime. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Thank the gentleman for his opening statement, and please now to uh, yield to the gentleman from uh, Texas, uh, Mr. Turner, for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I welcome our witnesses as well, and I do agree, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is probably one of the most important uh, issues this Congress can deal with. Uh, having been active in trying to work uh, not only here in Congress but previously in the Texas legislature in combating uh, 
uh, drugs and, and supporting drug treatment efforts. I must say that I think it's important for us to recognize at the outset of this hearing that progress in drug treatment and success in drug treatment oftentimes is incremental and difficult to measure. And what some would consider a failure in terms of the statistics might in fact, in truth, be success rates. So it's a very difficult area. And I, I want to also say that uh, in Texas, we have experimented successfully with funding uh, faith-based drug treatment programs. And while it is very true that successful drug treatment programs must contain certain elements uh, to, to be sure that they are working properly, the overlay of the emphasis on faith-based programs oftentimes has proven in Texas to be very successful. And so, though I think it would be an error to say that any program operating under the name of a faith-based program would, would be worthy of, of funding and, and worthy of support, I have found that there are many faith-based programs that operate on very sound principles and that when operated under those sound principles, uh, the addition of a faith-based emphasis has proven very successful. After all, as we all understand, getting off of drugs involves a very personal commitment on the part of the person receiving treatment. And oftentimes, faith can be an important element in assisting them in successfully uh, getting off of drugs. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, and I'm hopeful that uh, the hearing will be productive and that this Congress can move forward in uh, fighting the problem of drug abuse that is so widespread in this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. At this time, I'd like to wel welcome our first uh, panel of experts, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Donald Vereen. Uh, who is the Deputy Director of the Office of National Drug uh, Control Policy. We have Dar Dr. Uh, Marcia Lily Blanton, and uh, she is an Associate Director of the United States General Accounting Office. Uh, Dr. Sally Sattel is a psychiatrist at the OASIS Clinic. Dr. Uh, Eric Wish is a Director for the Center for Substance Abuse. And uh, Mr. Raymond uh, Susick. Uh, is president of the Haymarket uh, Center. Uh, pleased to welcome our panelists. Uh, this is an investigations and oversight uh, subcommittee of Congress, and we do swear in all of our witnesses. So if you would please stand. Raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do will reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Uh, again, I'm pleased to welcome uh, each of you to our panel this morning. Um, let me just, uh, some of you uh, I know have testified uh, before and may be familiar, but uh, we do try to limit uh, your uh, verbal uh, and oral comments uh, to the subcommittee uh, to five minutes. If you have lengthy uh, statements, uh, or additional material which you'd like made part of the record, we will do that by unanimous consent. Uh, so we ask you uh, to uh, adhere uh, to that rule. And uh, we will proceed at this time first by welcoming and recognizing uh, Dr. Donald uh, Vereen. Sir, you're recognized and welcome. Good morning. Um, on behalf of uh, Director McCaffrey, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to uh, testify today on the critically important matter of drug treatment in the criminal justice system. Um, as members of, of um, uh, this committee, um, as the members well know, drug treatment is an essential component of our national strategy. Um, you're familiar with the strategy uh, that was um, um, developed uh, to break the cycle of drugs and crime and reduce the hardcore user population. I'm especially pleased to have the opportunity now when Congress is approaching final decisions on the FY99 National Drug Control Strategy and Budget. Um, and it's, of course, import, um, the hope of uh, Director McCaffrey and myself that the Congress will adopt the strategy and the budget um, as the interrelated whole that they represent. It's very important to emphasize that 
the whole and its integrity is what's important and treatment is a very important part of that and treatment within the criminal justice system is an important part of, um, of, of that. Um, but before I do that, it's important to recognize members of this committee. Um, uh, Congressman Micah, your comments were right on target. Um, uh, the motivation, the experiences that you uh, shared with us uh, make it very clear why this is a, uh, an important issue and an important problem uh, to tackle. Um, I want to recognize um, Chairman Hastert um, and Representative Barrett for your leadership uh, in this area and also to thank Representative Cummings um, um, for, for much support. So I have a written statement um, um, and uh, I'd like to ask that it be made a part of the record for the proceedings. Without objection, so ordered. Okay. And I'll be very brief. The Congress has provided consistent bipartisan support for the drug treatment research agenda. The drug treatment research budget has gone from $194.4 million in 1992 to $323.5 million in 1998. Um, that's a 66.4% uh, increase. Um, as the former special assistant to the Director of Medical Affairs uh, at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, I'm keenly aware and appreciative of, of the support um, um, of, those, of, of that. Today, I ask the committee to consider the fruits of that research and assist the Office of National Drug Control Policy in bringing federal policy and resource allocation into agreement with what the research has been teaching us. It's a very important point that we'll try to underscore here. First, the research has demonstrated that drug treatment has a consistent and significant positive impact on criminal behavior, drug use, employment, and disease transmission with its associated health care costs. And we have several studies that are documented in the, in the, in the written uh, stuff that's been submitted. But I have a picture to show you. Could we uh, put this up quickly? So that you get a visual sense of of uh, the effects of uh, drug treatment on the kinds of outcomes that we're interested in. In terms of illicit drug use, uh, this is after treatment, there's a 50% um, decrease in illicit drug use after treatment. Six months, one year, 18 months out, that, that's uh, uh, an average. This is from a particular study, but the, the point is there's a significant decrease in illicit drug use after treatment. Drug selling behavior goes down even further. We're presenting this in the positive. Nearly 80% reduction in um, uh, drug selling behavior. A decrease in arrests um, in the one year period after uh, drug treatment at 60%, a 60% decrease, and a more than 40% decrease in homelessness. Uh, another important outcome to, to look at, um, and it's important to illustrate that drug use and its, uh, and its consequences are broad. Um, and um, intervention at this level uh, has broad outcomes as well. As a recent Harvard study noted, even given its present state of development and uneven application when compared to other life-saving interventions, drug treatment in terms of net cost and life expectancy gain and, all, um, uh, and a couple of other issues, substance abuse treatments rank in the top 10%. To give you an example, uh, drug treatment compares at the same level of the successful treatments of diabetes mellitus, um, asthma and hypertension. The same set of issues that are associated with those chronic diseases um, uh, and the outcomes associated with the treatments by uh, the established uh, uh, medical uh, profession, um, drug treatment compares um, very favorably at the same level. Second, the research has identified areas in which drug treatment should and can be improved. Today, I can say to you with confidence, we know how to deliver effective drug treatment and rehabilitation uh, services. 
but our challenge is to make this information available in a clear and persuasive manner. We're working very hard on that. Third, the research has identified areas in which current federal policy and research alloca resource allocations um, runs counter to what we know. We must make a course correction if we're to get the biggest public safety and public health bang for our buck. A brief note on other recent uh, scientific findings. Last week, the Family Research Council released the results of their poll of American voters. They found that 68% of those polled believe that providing drug treatment to inmates before they're released will reduce future crime. Even more impressive, 76% supported coercing addicts who commit crime into drug treatment programs. The source and the substance of these findings reinforce the practical sense of the American people and the nonpartisan nature of the growing national consensus uh, on the importance of drug treatment. The science is clear, and, and quite apparently, the American people have an understanding of this. The science is supporting what, what people are, are, are thinking and believing, and vice versa. Finally, I respectfully ask the members of the committee and the entire Congress to join us in implementing the strategy. Uh, the strategy and drug budget are made up of mutually supportive and interdependent parts. Um, the resulting whole being greater, um, but requiring all of the parts. We congratulate the House on its strong support for increasing the substance abuse block grant and drug court programs. On the other hand, we're quite disappointed that the modest $85 million, um, uh, $85 million drug intervention program, which would allow the Department of Justice to expand the Breaking the Cycle initiative, uh, by supporting testing, treatment, and graduated sanctions to more communities did not receive uh, support. All, are, uh, all of these are essential uh, to our progress in breaking the cycle of drugs and crime. Without these elements, uh, the very integrity of the tenure uh, strategy is threatened. Furthermore, I think we uh, can all agree that federal policy uh, should encourage, not hinder, state implementation of proven approaches Congress should allow states to use federal uh, prison funding for testing and treatment and use federal prison uh, treatment um, funds for post-incarceration, transitional, and follow-up services. Uh, they're critical. Um, um, and these simple steps, uh, we believe, will bring our actions into closer um, conf conformance with our knowledge and that our return uh, on our research investment then will be obvious. Thanks a lot. I uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Vereen, uh, for your comments. We're going to withhold uh, any questions till we finish the whole panel. But just say uh, that uh, I, I want to take just a moment to uh, congratulate uh, our director of the National Office of uh, Drug Control Policy, Dr. McCaffrey, uh, for his uh, leadership and his. Um, uh, outspokenness uh, uh, that I think was very warranted uh, towards uh, uh, policy uh, uh, in Netherlands uh, and uh, the, the legalization uh, that that country has experimented with is, is indeed uh, disastrous and he's been very courageous uh, in making those uh, statements and sticking to his guns uh, uh, and uh, that followed by his uh, performance on the needle exchange uh, a program where we're really pleased at the cooperation. And finally, just uh, as a footnote, uh, we are interested in putting whatever resources that can be justified from the Congress uh, to the Department of Justice and other agencies, and we'll work with you. And that indeed is one of the reasons for this hearing uh, to determine uh, what is effective and uh, what uh, funds can be used and what treatment programs will work. With those uh, quick comments, I'd like to now recognize uh, Dr. Marcia Lily Blanton, who's the Associate Director of the United States General Accounting Office. Welcome, and you're recognized. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for um, inviting me. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'd also like to ask if my full testimony could be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Each year, the federal government, states, and private entities spend billions of dollars on drug treatment. The federal government alone spent $3.2 billion in fiscal year 1998, representing 20% of the federal drug control budget. 
It's estimated that about 2.4 million individuals obtained some form of drug treatment in 1996, the most recent year for which data are available. Because drug treatment is a significant component of the nation's drug control strategy, you asked us to, to provide you with information on what is known about the effectiveness of drug treatment. My comments are based on our review and synthesis of findings from major evaluations of drug abuse treatment effectiveness. In brief, we found that several large multi-site longitudinal studies have produced considerable evidence that drug abuse treatment is beneficial to the individual in treatment and to society. However, growing concerns about the validity of self-reported data on drug use suggest that the benefits of treatment reported by these studies may be overstated. Now I'd like to talk specifically about our major findings in the report. First, based on several major studies conducted over a period of nearly 30 years, there is consistent evidence, as we, has already been said, that a substantial proportion of clients being studied report reductions in drug use and criminal activity at least one year following treatment. The most recent of these studies, the Drug Abuse Treatment Outcome Study, called DATOS, found, for example, that drug use among a sample of clients in a residential treatment program was reduced by more than half from 66% of the clients reporting weekly or more frequent cocaine use in the year prior to treatment to 22% reporting regular cocaine use after treatment. Also, predatory illegal activity was reduced by more than half from 41% of the clients to 16% after treatment. Involvement in criminal activity is one of several outcome measures generally assessed in evaluations of drug treatment. This is partly because the link between drug use and criminal activity is not inconsequential. At least half of the people brought into the nation's criminal justice system have a substance abuse problem. And a large percentage of the participants in the studies we reviewed were involved with the criminal justice system. For example, 56% of DATO's clients reported being on probation, on parole, or awaiting trial. As such, the benefits of treatment are generally measured in terms of reductions in not only drug use, but in criminal activity as well. Our second major finding is concerned with the quality of the evidence on the effectiveness of treatment. Because all of the effectiveness studies relied on information reported by the clients, the level of benefit derived from treatment may be overstated. Although this method of data collection is commonly used in national surveys and drug abuse treatment evaluations, recent questions about the validity of self-reported drug use raise concerns about this approach. A recent National Institute of Drug Abuse review of current research on clients in the criminal justice system and clients formally in treatment suggests that 50% or fewer current users accurately report their drug use. As questions have developed about the accuracy of self-reported data, researchers have begun using more objective means to validate such data. For example, researchers involved in the National Treatment Improvement Evaluation Study, called ENTIES, collected objective measures of drug use on a subset of clients and found that 20% of those in the validation group acknowledged cocaine use within the past 30 days, but your analysis revealed recent cocaine use to be 29%. Because the results from the major studies of treatment effectiveness were not adjusted for the likelihood of underreported drug use, as was found in ENTIES, the reductions in drug use found may be overstated. Finally, our last finding focused on evidence that is available for specific groups of drug users. Using federal dollars most effectively requires an understanding of which approaches work best for different groups of drug users. On this subject, however, research findings are less definitive. Although strong evidence supports methadone maintenance as the most effective treatment for heroin addiction, less is known about the best ways to provide treatment services to cocaine users or to adolescents. For cocaine abusers, a number of pharmacotherapies have been studied and some have proven successful in one or more clinical trials. No medication, however, has demonstrated substantial efficacy once subjected to several rigorously controlled trials. And without a pharmacologic agent, researchers have relied and treatment practitioners on cognitive behavioral therapies to treat cocaine addiction. 
For adolescents, a population we've talked about for which there's great concern because of growing use of drugs among teens, the evidence is also less definitive. Although family-based interventions show promise as an effective treatment for adolescents, no one treatment approach has been shown to be consistently superior to others in achieving better treatment outcomes for this population. In conclusion, the federal government currently provides substantial support for drug treatment. Monitoring the performance of treatment programs can help ensure that we are making progress to achieve the nation's drug control goals. Although studies conducted over nearly three decades consistently show that treatment reduces drug use and crime, current data collection techniques do not allow accurate measurement of the extent to which treatment reduces the use of illicit drugs. This concludes my prepared statement, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you or members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you for your testimony. I'd now I'd like to recognize uh, Dr. Sally Sattel, who is a psychiatrist uh, with the OASIS Clinic. Welcome, and you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me today. I, I do agree with the findings of the GAO report that benefits of treatment are probably overstated. Uh, but it's also true that drug treatment can work to help patients lead a drug-free life, and that's my subject today, how to make it more effective than it currently is. And the answer, in short, is leverage, going by other names, external pressure, coercion, being forced into treatment, involuntary treatment, basically knowing that there are going to be consequences for drug use. We know three things about treatment. One is that it works, and here I'm going to define work as a person becomes basically abstinent after treatment, not reduces their use, but becomes abstinent. Um, if patients complete it, now this transcends whatever type of treatment it is. It's completion that's important, but few patients complete it. Maybe one in five actually finish. The dropout rates are very big. So the challenge of treatment is really retention. The second thing we know is that addicts do not have to be motivated initially to quit drugs in order for treatment to work. That's counterintuitive. You may not have heard it. People don't necessarily have to be out of denial in order to benefit from treatment. And the third point, and this is the one I want to focus on here, is that people like me, the treatment providers in the, on the front line, we need all the help we can get in terms of getting people into treatment and keeping them there until they finish it. And we need the help from other social institutions, like the workplace, the criminal justice system, even the housing authority, the welfare system, because these can help us exert leverage. What I want to do now is discuss leverage through the, for the rest of the testimony and the various sites in which it can be applied. Okay, the first one would be the workplace. I'm just going to cite you a recent study here from the uh, University of Pennsylvania. They looked at a group of uh, people who worked in a uh, transportation workers from a union in Philadelphia. And if you tested positive, you had to go to treatment. They compared the people who basically were forced to go into treatment, who were told, if you don't go to treatment, your job is, is you've lost your job. They compared them to the patients who said, who volunteered for treatment, said, I have a drug problem, I better get treatment. The patients who were coerced stayed longer in treatment and they did both groups did about as well again illustrating that one can be can be coerced into a treatment program and do well also there is the housing domain there is an interesting study by someone named Jesse Milby a psychologist at the University of Alabama and his work with homeless crack addicts was not to put them in conventional treatment but to put them in a work therapy program where they refurbish condemned houses and they got a modest amount of money for that and uh, these were people who uh, could live in the housing if they participated in the work program, but only if their urines were clean. And uh, they found that after six months, those who were in this work therapy program were far more likely to be clean using less cocaine and fewer days of homelessness than those in regular treatment. And then we come to drug courts, something Mr. Barnett mentioned. Uh, these offer nonviolent offend repeat offenders um, the possibility of dismissed charges if they complete a treatment program. These are heavily monitored treatment programs. The judge meets with the, with the participants, uh, sometimes weekly, at least monthly, and there are what's called graduated <coughs> sanctions, and this is very important for infractions. A graduated sanction means a small punishment the first time you mess up, 
have a positive urine or, or miss a session. Uh, maybe one day in jail, then two days in jail the next time, three days in jail. Finally, you know, you can overstep the limits, but those kind of graduated sanctions are very effective. They're certain, they're swift, and they're not really set that severe. Retention rates in drug court treatment is four to five times that in regular treatment, and drug court participants have lower rearrest rates than those adjudicated in the traditional way. Um, I also wanted to mention a little bit about um, the, pub the domain of public service. Uh, for example, there's a, the Doe Foundation in New York City. It operates something called a Ready, Willing, and Able training program, and its shelters require that patients, uh, that participants or residents in those shelters be, be drug-free. Recently, the foundation took over a 192-bed uh, shelter in New York. 62% of the people in that shelter tested positive. With, uh, once they uh, instituted their policy of regular drug testing, 2% were testing positive. Now, more nonprofit uh, homeless shelters and churches are requiring this sort of thing. Now, my patients readily admit to me that external p uh, pressure helps. One patient said he was going to look for a job as a truck driver just because he knew he would get urine testing and someone would be checking over his shoulder. Um, also, had a patient who was relieved that they were going to start drug testing on the job. I've had women patients who uh, the welfare runs out because their youngest child turns 18. They have to get a job, and they stop using. Now, this is in methadone. So these are people who are also using cocaine, for example. Um, finally, a woman entered a um, job training program where there was drug testing, and she stopped, but not until they started testing in her job training program. So you can imagine I was horrified when I uh, saw a patient who said he was on parole this was a patient whose urines were consistently positive. I asked him, well, what does your parole officer do? And he said, well, he tests me. I said, what does he do when you're positive? And the patient said, oh, nothing, because he says you're in treatment, so it's OK. No, <laughs> I depend on that parole officer to help me here to set these limits. So the point I want to conclude with is that consequences matter. Clinicians need all the help they can get, and the more reinforcement from other social institutions, the better. <coughs> Thank you very much. I have a full statement that I hope you'll include in the record. Thank you, and we, we will include uh, your entire statement as part of the record. Now, please to recognize uh, Dr. Eric uh, Wish, who's director of the Center for Substance Abuse. Welcome, and you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the other members of the subcommittee for this privilege to uh, address you this morning. Good morning. Um, I speak today as a psychologist with over 25 years of experience doing substance abuse research. And I'm not going to bore you with a lot of my background. It's in my written remarks and additional materials, which I am requesting that you place on the record. Without objection, so ordered. Okay, thank you. But I, I'd like to, uh, for a moment, just tell you a short story. I was at a national conference about a year ago, and a very brilliant social scientist came up to me, and he said, you know, Eric, you've spent your career studying the obvious. Actually, he said, proving the obvious. So I um, picked myself up off the floor, and I said to him, what do you mean? He said to me, how could anyone in this day and age expect other people to admit to using cocaine? I spent much of my career looking at um, drug use and offenders, primarily by using urinalysis. And in 1984, I established a a research study funded by the National Institute of Justice in which I collected urine samples, voluntary anonymous urine samples, from basically about 5,000 people who had been recently arrested and who were charged with, with anything that you might be charged with in coming through a booking, the booking facility. And we found at that time that 42% of the people arrested tested positive for cocaine, meaning almost half had used cocaine in the last two to three days. When we went back in two years, la um, two years later, in 1986, that number had moved to 80%. Um, that study showed that many more arrestees tested positive for cocaine metabolite than admitted recent use of the drug in the confidential research interviews. These findings provided indisputable evidence that were subsequently replicated in numerous studies that researchers, let alone criminal justice personnel, would greatly underestimate current drug use in a detainee population if they relied solely on people to accurately report their current use of illegal drugs. For example, we went into the Intentional Supervision Probation Program in Brooklyn and found about six times more 
um, users of cocaine, this is among probationers, than their probation and officers thought were using the drug. So, and that was based on the urine testing. Um, since doing the research in New York City, uh, the Department of Justice, the National Institute of Justice established the Duff program, and the types of findings that I presented to you on the drug use and arrestees in Manhattan has been replicated across the country. We're basically, um, regardless of charge, about anywhere from 40 to 70 percent of the people who are arrested and processed um, test positive for an illicit drug. My thesis today is simple. A growing body of research studies provide convincing evidence that in the 1990s, researchers must rely on more than self-reports to estimate recent illegal drug use. I emphasize in the 1990s because we live in a period of zero tolerance of any illegal drug use, and even of the use of some legal drugs like tobacco products and alcohol. It is difficult to believe today that in 1974, Dr. Peter Bourne, who later became President Carter's drug policy advisor, said that he could not understand DEA's efforts to interdict cocaine, quote, the most benign of illicit drugs currently in widespread use, unquote. How different a society we live in today, where our children are bombarded with commercials warning them of the consequences from using illegal drugs. Our society's increasing stigmatization of illegal drug use, in addition to the whole fear of HIV, affects surveys respondents' willingness to report illegal drug use and explains why researchers find more underreporting of drug use in studies conducted today than in studies conducted when drug use was considered more benign. So much of the research in the 70s and early 80s could show that people might admit to their drug use, but at that time, it was more accepted in our society than it is now. I'm emphasizing the limitations of using self-reports to measure recent drug use because persons are more likely to report using illegal drugs six months or a year ago than they are to report use in the past three days. People fare greater consequences if they admit to currently using an illegal drug rather than use in the more distant past. Now, some scientists are quick to play down the implications of studies of the validity of self-reports by RSDs because they claim that persons under the criminal justice supervision are least likely to report their drug use, regardless of the guarantees of confidentiality that researchers give them. However, there is extensive evidence, which, are, which is in my written testimony, that underreporting is a problem in surveys of all types of populations. It could be argued that persons in contact with the criminal justice system, the homeless and employees, may have significant reasons for underreporting their drug use, even in confidential research interviews, as the other research uh, that I'm not going over shows. One might expect, however, that drug abuse treatment clients would find little reason to con conceal their drug use, especially at admission to treatment. Assessment and diagnostic tools generally rely upon the person's accurate reporting of recent drug use and associated problems. Moreover, treatment evaluation studies often depend on self-report measures of drug use at intake and at follow-up to assess treatment outcomes. Systematic differences in underreporting of drug use would greatly overestimate the beneficial results of drug treatment. The evidence suggests, however, that even drug abuse treatment clients may systematically underreport under their recent drug use. So the recent literature raises important questions regarding the validity of self-report measures of drug use in a variety of contexts, and it can no longer be assumed that research subjects will accurately report on their illicit drug use when queried query during confidential research interviews. I have three recommendations to the subcommittee. One. All federally funded studies of illegal drug use should assess drug use by the analysis of biological specimens as well as by self-reports whenever feasible. Such a procedure is especially important in evaluating treatment outcome. Without biological testing, it is virtually impossible for researchers and policymakers to be certain of the accuracy of changes in illegal drug use after treatment. Two, the GAO report and measurement of drug use recommended that the national surveys of students and household members utilize biological measures of recent drug use to assess the validity of self-reported illegal drug use. A soon-to-be-released study that used the methodology of the National Household Survey and also collected hair samples to measure drug use found much higher estimates of cocaine use from the hair test than from the interview responses. It is indefensible that federally funded national surveys have not conducted validity studies using biological specimens. This subcommittee should see to it that these expensive drug surveys not rely solely upon respondents to report their illegal drug use. 
National drug policy must be built upon the most accurate data we can obtain. And three, the federal government should foster development and testing of new technologies to measure drug use. Hair analysis has been found by some researchers to offer advantages in detecting the use of drugs such as cocaine and heroin. If further research can confirm hair analysis potential for longer periods of detection compared with hair analysis and reduce vulnerability to con contamination, hair analysis may offer researchers a new tool for improving the measurement of illegal drug use. The ill-advised actions of government personnel to retard and inhibit the research uses of hair analysis techniques should be investigated. I have been affiliated with several studies that propose to use hair analysis and had been approved for funding by peer review panels only to receive award letters that specifically prohibited spending any of the federal funds on the hair analysis. Such ill-advised actions prevent scientists from developing and testing new methods for measuring drug use. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I, I welcome your comments and questions, and I salute your efforts to improve the methodology used to uh, evaluate the efficacy of drug treatment. Thank you, Dr. Wish. Uh, now, I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Raymond Susek or Suchek? Socek. Socek. I destroyed that. Uh, apologize. Uh, who's president of the Haymarket uh, Center? You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman for providing Haymarket Center with the oppor this opportunity to, pre uh, to present testimony. My oral statement is an abbreviated version of my written testimony, and I ask that it be placed into the record. Without objection, so ordered. I serve as president of Haymarket, a comprehensive substance abuse treatment center located on the near west side of Chicago. It was founded in 1975 by Monsignor Ignatius McDermott, a Catholic priest. Over the past 23 years, we have grown into the largest treatment center in the city of Chicago and the third largest in the state of Illinois. <clears throat> we offer comprehensive and integrated treatment services to an average of 13,000 unduplicated clients annually. We are pleased that Congressman Hassert chose to visit our facility earlier this month. Accompanying me today is Ms. Betty Foley, Associate Director of Haymarket. Betty is an expert on two special substance abuse populations within the treatment field, the nonviolent and pre uh, offender and the uh, pregnant woman and postpartum woman. She is available to answer any questions to you and your colleague and that, that you or your colleagues may have. She will also be providing testimony tomorrow. Haymarket Center is a non-secretarian, non-denominational, not-for-profit organization. We consider our treatment approach, however, to be faith-based since we believe that spirituality plays a role in recovery. Spirituality in our programs is focused on our efforts to reunite and reconnect recovering addicts with, with aspects and relationships in their lives which, have been separated because of, which they have been separated from because of their addiction. This approach, most commonly employed through our integrating 12-step principles into our treatment programs, uh, focuses in on reconnecting our clients to themselves and to others who were important in their lives before the substance abuse took control over their lives. We at Haymarket have developed several unique programs to address the needs of high-risk populations through our 23 years. Uh, we refer to this as a continuum of care. This continuum, the integration of drug abuse prevention, drug abuse treatment, medical and health services, daycare, parenting training, vocational education, job placement, and screening for domestic violence and gambling addiction. The continuum provides clients with a comprehensive and integrated range of treatment programs. Clients are encouraged to address all issues related to their addiction as they progress along the continuum of care. Clients are informed that spirituality through faith can be an important factor in their efforts towards total recovery. In order to ensure that each Haymarket client receives specific and individualized services he or she may require, we continuously enhance the development and implementation of programs for men, women, and families that are based on gender differences, uh, cultural sensitivity, and the ever-changing demands for services. Our mission is to return recovering addicts to society in a drug-free state, but also in a condition that is physically, mentally, and spiritually healthy and thus enabling them to become more productive members of society. Our model of the integration of comprehensive services enables us to meet that goal. We feel that it is crucial to, uh, crucial to stress today that treatment works and that in investing in innovative and effective substance abuse treatment methods is a crucial component of the federal government's drug control policy. 
Along with prevention, treatment is an essential component in any demand reduction strategy. Based on our experience with the frontline fight against substance abuse, we believe treatment is the most cost-effective way to combat addiction and drug-related crime. This belief, belief is backed by extensive research, which confirms that treatment is cost-effective. Unfortunately, less than one-third of the federal drug budget is devoted to reducing the demand for drugs, and treatment is too often overlooked. We are pleased that the House Appropriations Committee recently uh, reported a bill uh, providing increased funding for the programs of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. We ask that the members of this subcommittee support these funding increases for SAMHSA. As good stewards of federal funding, the treatment community can continue to improve services by equipping itself with a better understanding of which treatment methods are most effective with which subgroups of abusers and addicts. For example, <clears throat> program models which are, were developed to treat white male the white male population may not be directly transferable to other groups such as the black female pregnant woman. Finally, the GAO uh, study published in March of this year verifies that treatment consistently reduces drug use and crime, but current data collection techniques do not allow accurate measurement of, of the extent to which treatment reduces the use of illegal drugs. One Haymarket program, however, has recently been evaluated to dem demonstrate results. In 1995, Haymarket received a grant from the Center of Substance Abuse Treatment to implement and to evaluate comprehensive residential treatment, child care, and aftercare program for chemically dependent women and their children. This program, called Athey Hall, uh, also had a two-year evaluation component. This was con uh, the evaluation component was conducted by CSAT in fall of 1997 and concluded with a report on the status of clients who successfully completed the Athey Hall program. Through interviews with clients, family members, and close personal con contact, and also with the use of random urine screens, the evaluators determined that the recovery rate for the discharged clients from Athey Hall's first two years was approximately 70%. Even in the worst case, with all non-reporting clients assumed to have recidivized, this recovery rate exceeds the norm for Illinois. Uh, the majority of these clients, uh, of these recovering clients, have had jobs uh, and maintained jobs, have gone back to school, have received custody of their children, and have established independent housing for themselves and their families. With us today, we have several copies of this and other research which confirms that treatment works and it is cost effective. We would be happy to share these uh, reports with the members of the subcommittee and ask that they be included in the hearing record. Mr. Chairman and the members of the subcommittee, as Congress determines the direction and best use of federal resources and the scope of policy with regards to our nation's substance abuse epidemic, we urge you to recognize treatment as a vital and effective component of the overall war on drugs. Knowledge and implementation of comprehensive and effective treatment practices is the most successful strategy treatment providers can employ in our mission to move people away from dependency and towards become, becoming productive members of society. We hope that you will recognize the value of treatment as you develop new legislation to implement drug control strategies. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Ms. Foley and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, and uh, I thank each of our panelists uh, for their uh, expert uh, testimony today. And I'd like to uh, start uh, with a round of uh, questioning. Um, it appears that we're spending somewhere around $3.2 billion on drug treatment programs uh, from uh, federal uh, treasury. It also appears from this uh, GAO report uh, that uh, one of the problems uh, that we have in determining whether uh, programs are successful or not is that uh, uh, that uh, measuring the effectiveness of drug treatment is a complex undertaking uh, and involves a number of factors. Uh, we've also heard testimony here today that, that raises some questions about um, self-reports. Uh, Dr. Breen, it's my understanding that uh, most of the information we base uh, our uh, reports of success or our measure our success are 
are obtained uh, from uh, self reports of addicts. Is that correct? Yes, that's true. Um, it is important to understand, though, that self-report is used um, to measure um, a number of health outcomes. So, for example, um, I had mentioned that um, the effectiveness of treatment for drug abuse is comparable to that of diabetes. There are many people, in fact, most people don't stick with their their treatment regimen properly uh, for the treatment of diabetes. Perhaps more than half don't follow uh, their recommended insulin intake, for example. And they report, they self-report that they have been following the regimen. We do have new biological markers, for example, to measure if people's sugars have, have reached a high point. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ingrained problem that we have in studying health outcomes and, and uh, uh, drug abuse uh, treatment effectiveness is not alone. It's, it's a problem with trying to uh, assess the outcomes of other treatments as well. Well, so we've heard a couple of our witnesses testify to the fact that the least effective uh, measure is a self-reporting, and and uh, particularly of uh, addicts, uh, and uh, the GAO study also uh, uh, raises questions about self-reporting. Uh, Dr. Lily Blanton, did yeah, you want I, to right? I just comment? want to explain. I think one of the differences. Um, he is correct. Dr. Green is correct when he says we use self-report routinely in measuring health outcomes. I think the difference when we're talking about self-report of drug use is that we're measuring, in this case, an illegal activity. And when you're measuring an illegal activity, particularly an illegal activity that has consequences, the likelihood of under-reporting something that you know those consequences could be severe is much higher. So I think that while he's correct, there are some differences. Now, what we do know is that self-report is the least accurate when you are asking questions about the more stigmatized drugs. So that, for example, if you're asking information about cocaine or heroin versus marijuana, you can find self-reports to be less accurate for the cocaine. We also know that self-report is less accurate for current drug use. So that, in many cases, our surveys, at least in treatment, have asked for information on previous year or past year. So we at least are not asking for the what we know is the least accurate of measures. We're, we're taking most of our data from self-reporting. We've also heard recommendations from expert, experts that the best way to get data is through drug testing. Uh, that gives, can give you uh, very current information. You've also just testified that the least likely uh, truthful response is going to deal with the current situation mm -hmm. uh, and current abuse problems. So wouldn't it make sense that we require uh, very objective uh, drug testing, urine analysis, hair analysis, or something uh, to see what the results are? Would, would that be correct? Well, actually, that's one. We don't make recommendation in our report in this case but we so we at least are not asking for the what we know is the least accurate well, of measures. We're, we're taking most of our data from self-reporting we've also heard recommendations from expert experts that the best way to get data is through drug testing uh, that gives can give you uh, very current information. You've also just testified that the least likely uh, truthful response is going to deal with the current situation mm -hmm. uh, and current abuse problems. So wouldn't it make sense that we require uh, very objective uh, drug testing, urine analysis, hair analysis, or something uh, to see what the results are? Would, would that be correct? Well, actually, that's one. We don't make a recommendation in our report in this case, but we have, in a previous report, encouraged greater use of more objective measures. Um, and I want to be a 
a little constrained because we think that there is some more testing and development of the technology before we routinely encourage the use of hair testing. But certainly, when you can use objective measures with Fish. either subsamples um, or in... Um, so in supporting uh, the expenditure of federal taxpayer dollars in programs that we want to find out whether they're really su successful or not, we should have a testing component. Some objective measure. One of the that things that concern me is most of the data that it appears that we're using uh, to determine how we're spending our money and what programs uh, uh, are funded comes from this data, uh, which is Drug Abuse Treatment Outcome Study by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And uh, I have information that, uh, uh, well, first of all, 56% of the subjects of uh, the data study were on parole. Uh, and then we find that uh, uh, a random sample of the addicts uh, who were urine tested a year later uh, in, in a random sample, up to 20% refused to take the test, and a huge m number who took the test failed after saying that they weren't uh, using a drug. So I really become concerned about the basis and, uh, of a, or the study basis that we're using, uh, the information that we're getting, and then the results. Uh, and again, the chart that's been brought here, any program where we spend uh, billions of taxpayer dollars and we have a 50% success rate and we're not sure that, that uh, we can even rely on that, those figures, uh, we, uh, we, we need to revisit. Uh, so I have some concerns. Uh, finally, uh, I don't know about other uh, programs uh, uh, that are uh, private or faith-based, and, uh, and yours in particular, that uh, you referred to as part of the Haymarket uh, Center. Um, but uh, I have one in my locality, uh, the House of Hope, and they run a 90% uh, success rate, uh, pretty well uh, substantiated uh, and documented uh, success rate, whereas some of my secular programs uh, uh, have much uh, lower uh, success rate figures. What uh, kind of a success rate do you uh, uh, attribute to your program, sir? Well, we have a, um, a study that shows that in Illinois, the typical uh, uh, success is around 40% uh, of the people in any given program in Illinois will remain uh, drug-free after their initial uh, treatment. Uh, with our population, we are slightly below that 40% uh, percent mark um, in terms of recidivism. So we, we are doing better with our programs uh, with probably the toughest population uh, to treat in Illinois because we deal with the criminal justice population, we deal with the population that's the minority population, the population that typically comes from the housing projects. Um, there is a lot of coercion that, uh, that uh, gets people into treatment, uh, whether it's coercion to stay in a, a living environment or because of the criminal justice system. Um, so our programs fare slightly better uh, in terms of recovery rates uh, than uh, the, the state as a whole. And what type of federal funds do you receive? We receive uh, federal black, uh, block grant dollars uh, for our women and children's services and, and pregnant uh, women and postpartum women's services and uh, we receive a specialized program grant uh, that I mentioned in my uh, testimony for uh, a two-year, a five-year study uh, of women and children in long-term residential care. What percentage of federal funds uh, is uh, uh, Our federal funding is probably revenue. in the area of 30 to 35 percent of our budget. Well, my time has expired. I'd like to come back, but I'd like to uh, yield now to our ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Inevitably, when you have a, a report like this, um, the question arises as to whether we are using our resources effectively. And even without a report like this, oftentimes here in Congress, the debate that occurs is, is where the money should be spent. Uh, it's a pie. How do you divide the pie? Should more resources be put into 
incarceration? Should more resources be put into treatment? Should more resources be put into uh, prevention programs? Should more resources be put into border programs? Um, and the question I have for each of you is, do you feel as we divide up that pie, um, based on either this report or your own experiences, that we should be cutting the treatment dollars, uh, either as a as a absolute figure or as a percentage of of the pie? And I'd start with you, Dr. Vereen. Definitely not. If you look at the uh, Cal Data study, where California looked at its investment in treatment, for every dollar they invested in treatment, they saved they they basically saved seven dollars. They got a, I'm sorry, a seven dollar return on their investment in savings in health care costs, prison, and other criminal justice costs. Um, that's where you get the best bang for your buck, as I said in my earlier statement. In addition, we've invested large amounts of of federal dollars uh, on the research side. And we're just beginning to see the fruits of that research. We're, we're understanding better what addiction is so that we know exactly what it is we're treating. And the effects of treatment, not only on what's happening biologically in the brain, but what's happening behaviorally. Um, and as we're trying to help the folks recover from, from addiction to become a, a good, um, uh, uh, contributing citizens. So in that sense, in that general sense, um, treatment is a very good investment. Uh, despite some of the amorphous uh, findings that, oh, we need to improve better how uh, we measure outcomes. Uh, we need to um, improve better uh, uh, the self-reporting way we go about generating data. Um, yes, there are ways that we can, we, we can uh, study this better and we can certainly improve treatment. But as it stands now, um, we're getting a very good return on what we put into treatment. So in that sense, I would not recommend cutting any, any dollars there. Dr. Lily Blatton. Well, in this report, I need to say we did not make recommendations on how to spend money. I understand that. Um, but I would say that our findings would show that treatment is beneficial both to the individual and society, even with an overstatement of the benefits, would support our at least continuing to maintain the level of investment that we have now. The only point I differ a little bit is I think that we really have to focus on improving the quality of our information about the effectiveness of treatment. We have a responsibility as we spend federal dollars to make sure that federal dollars are being spent on programs that are as effective as we can. So, so is your complaint or is your criticism more of the programs or that the information coming out of the programs is not accurate? Well, until you have good information from the programs, you can't really know whether we're spending our dollars on the programs that make the most I, difference. I understand. So the two are linked. And that's why we've got to invest in improving the quality of the information that we have. And I think Dr. Wish made a very convincing argument for why, why today is very different than 20, 30 years ago. And in terms of the pie, as we, as we look at the, where resources go, would you recommend cutting the percentage of the pie that goes to treatment? I really think that's a policy. I know, but you're a citizen, for goodness sakes. You have a... <laughs> you have a <laughs> I would say that we have got to invest more as a citizen in our treatment and less in our prisons. Right. Dr. Sattel? I would not cut um, <clears throat> any treatment money, but I would like to see a lot more of it go to the kinds of programs that the people be in, the, in panel two are going to be talking about, the criminal justice-based programs, drug courts, in, in prison, in jail treatment. Th those are very those are going to be very promising because, A, they catch a lot of addicts. Um, most hardcore addicts have some contact with the criminal justice system. I also think the program of coerced abstinence that the um, administration has funded is, is a very wise one. Um, should be extended to both probation and parole. Uh, coerced abstinence would be a regimented series of, of drug testing for those individuals with these graduated sanctions that I mentioned before. Um, 
Also, I, I wouldn't mind seeing some more residential programs, you know, the kind where people stay for 18 months to, to two years. When people complete those programs, they, they actually have a very high success rate, but you have to complete it. And my final point, I agree with what um, Dr. Blanton said and also Dr. Wish about the, the drug testing and uh, wanting to get more accurate information. But you also have to, I, I think, realize you'll get a double bang for the for the bug here. Not only will you get better information, but the drug tests themselves, assuming the clinics, you know, uh, respond to the data they get, if the, if the drug tests are positive and that there are consequences for being positive, you'll get a clinical, presumably you'll get a clinical impact as well as a, uh, you know, an information enhancing result. Thanks. Ex Dr. Wish. Thank you. Um, I want to correct a possible misimpression here that the assessment of treatment outcome is so bleak. There are a lot of good studies that have used biological measures to assess treatment outcome. The problem is there are also a lot of large national studies that have not, and that is what should be changed. <coughs> I also have to tell you that the CalData study is one of the worst examples of this problem. They basically brought people who had been in treatment into a room with an interviewer and in one interview they said, okay, how much, I'm exaggerating a little, but basically how much did you use drugs before you went to treatment and now how much are you using it now? And you know, anyone who being interviewed by someone who knows they've been in treatment, they want to look good. There's and a I, big social desirability. And I understand, but let me get back to my question. And I yeah. understand there are problems with right, self-reporting. Right. My, my question specifically is, do you think that we should be cutting that percentage of the pie that goes to treatment? Absolutely not. We are now moving towards focusing on the large illegal drug use problem in the adult offender population. But there are still people I hear, you know, every month I'll hear of someone who, a probation officer, someone who is, has someone who has a drug problem and they can't get them into treatment because there are not enough, there's no space for them. In addition, in our research, when we look at these adult offenders who are found to be um, almost walking drugstores, they're just pharmacologically overrun with drugs, and you ask them when they began their drug use. It isn't at 20, it isn't at 25, it's back in the early teens. And we in this country miss a tremendous opportunity to stop the problem early by intervening with the youths who are coming through the criminal justice system. And if you look at the, um, the, the uh, statistics on testing kids at different age who are coming through the criminal justice system, it goes up at a 45 degree angle where maybe 10% of the kids test positive for a drug at age 10, and by the time they're 16, it may be 30, 40, 60% like the well, adult. Dr. Sattel has suggested that we should be putting more resources in, in the prisons. Is that correct? I don't want to take words out oh, of your mouth. prison-based treatment. Yeah. Prison-based yeah. treatment. Yeah. Are you further refining that, saying in the juvenile justice system is where we should be doing that? I think we, should, we need to hit them before they get to prison. That's sort of the last resort when it comes to juveniles. There is this whole, whole group of, of kids coming in who are having problems, who are going back to the schools, and basically, for the most part, we don't assess them for drug use when they come into the system, and when they go back into the schools, there's no further follow-up. I would recommend that, since these are the high-risk kids who are going to be the, the uh, bigger problem of tomorrow, that we intervene with them when they go back to the schools, maybe do some drug testing, drug Definitely. prevention, and prevent them from going on to becoming one of these um, adult drug abusing offenders. Mr. Sochek? Um, no, I do not believe that we should be reducing treatment um, because obviously I'm a treatment provider uh, and treatment dollars support the services that, that we render. Um, I also would like to um, uh, cite some examples. Uh, when we talk about success, when the chairman asked me about what is success, it depends upon how you define success. We have a prenatal program that Ms. Foley is going to be talking about tomorrow. That program was started in the early 1990s. Uh, it was primarily for women who had cocaine problems, but they also abused alcohol. They also got into marijuana and other things, but primarily cocaine. When we started that program, um, we started it with the notion that we would take a woman at any time during her pregnancy, uh, which was a little bit different than other programs. They usually cut them off at the first five and a half months of their pregnancy. They would not admit them after that. Um, that program to date has produced, uh, as a result of a drug-free environment, proper medical care and proper nutrition, over 500 babies that have been born drug-free. 
Uh, just the cost effectiveness of that one program alone is probably saved in, in the course of those babies' lifetimes, maybe millions and billions of dollars uh, to the state, city, and federal level. We also have an alternate to incarceration program at Haymarket Center. And in that program, uh, we can measure success by, by one measure, completion of treatment. One of the uh, presenters today said that there's a one in five or one in four completion to treatment rate. In that program for nonviolent, typically DUI, driving under the influence offenders, who are multiple serious DUI offenders, they've, they've received more than one DUI, we have a 99% completion rate. Now this is coerced treatment, but we are a voluntary program, which means that the courts order them into treatment, but if they walk out, uh, we have no uh, ability to keep them there by any force other than reporting to the courts. Uh, something happens to those people in treatment. During the course of treatment, they initially resist what we're doing, but by the end of treatment, uh, many of them thank us for what we have done and return back to tell other people, uh, future participants in that program, uh, of their particular experiences. I also just want to mention briefly that Haymarket started as a social setting detox center in the city of Chicago in 1975. It was a very controversial program. It was for Skid Row alcoholic males. And it was controversial because people thought that uh, it would not provide the medical services necessary. Uh, we continued to do detoxification services at Haymarket. In the time and from its inception, uh, Haymarket has been credited by the Chicago Police Department, by the Cook County Hospital, and by other mental health agencies as probably saving not only people's lives, but uh, the lives of, of family members who have been put in and placed in jeopardy as a result of somebody uh, who is abusing or, or addicted to alcohol and substance abuse. The detox center has been credited for uh, the reduction in um, people coming in there with heat exhaustion uh, on a day like today, and then uh, before 1975, people would be li literally laying on the streets and dying and being taken into Cook County Hospital. Now they have a place to put them, and it's called Haymarket Center. So in our opinion, treatment does work. Success is uh, uh, something that uh, still needs to be defined. I don't know that success is always a person just remaining drug-free for the rest of their life. Um, but cutting treatment do dollars, in my opinion, would be disastrous. Dr. Sattel, is that how you pronounce mm -hmm. it? Um, you mentioned leverage, and tomorrow we're going to be having a hearing on the issue of cocaine moms and uh, the use of, of criminal justice sanctions or mm -hmm. um, children in need of protective services as they do in my state. Um, I think anybody who looks at this issue at first blush says, well, of course um, you want the mother to, to get the treatment. Um, but interestingly, we hear from some providers um, who argue that what you're doing is, in effect, preventing uh, disincentives for, for pregnant women to come into the, the medical field, the medical system. I, I'd like your comments yeah. on that. Yeah, I'd like to see their data on that. Um, the data I've seen are, is from <clears throat> the South Carolina experience, and actually, um, none of these, these were women who did not even keep did not have any prenatal uh, care at all, presented for the first time to the emergency room in some sort of oh, life-threatening crisis, either hemorrhaging or, or preterm labor. And uh, in fact, when they were sent out again, because they hadn't, you know, they were p patched up, so to speak, to finish the, uh, the, the pr term of the pregnancy and then, and then return to, to actually deliver, none of them kept their appointments with substance abuse. They were all referred to a treatment. Finally, they came back to have their babies. All were cocaine positive. The point is that that program there was started out of, out of desperation. And the population that it addresses are those who, frankly, aren't very good at keeping their prenatal appointments to begin with. So I don't know how many you would, you would lose if you instituted this, because the ones that it, it, it addresses, that a policy like this addresses, are those who are, who are so dysfunctional, they're not good at keeping their appointments to begin with. Um, also, uh, there was concern when the South Carolina experiment, not an experiment, the South Carolina program 
was in effect that the, the women would not return to have the babies and that's not not true they all returned the rate of home birth in the county in Charleston did, did not increase so there was there was no you know, fugitive birth so to speak they all did return and um, and actually they all uh, subsequently they were these were women who were as you know sent to um, given the choice of uh, treatment or or jail you know the subsequent population of women that this do you know if there's been chaos. Any, do you know if there's been any an okay. analysis of uh, a change in women seeking prenatal care other than anecdotal I mean I, mean, I certainly understand yeah that's the saying. only that's the only data I'm, I'm aware of do you know no, no but let me just mention I know of one source that I can suggest that you follow up on and I can also follow up on and get it back to you but I do want to mention that the one journal article that's been published on the South Carolina experience did look at birth rates in the county but it did not look at whether or not you had uh, women who actually went outside the county into surrounding areas and I think if you're going to really do a study to make an assessment of whether of the impact of that policy you got, you've got to look beyond just the county to see if women are seeking care elsewhere the, the one study that I know um, was dissertation research at John Hopkins by Catherine Acuff, and I can at least ask her um, what data source she used and did she do any other work that would better help us know the impact on help-seeking behavior. And I'll find out and get that I would back. appreciate yeah, it's, an, it's a good question. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Dr. Wish, uh, if we could focus on, on an area that I've heard about in, in my district back in Georgia and from, from some, uh, particularly parents uh, from other districts as well, and that is uh, drug testing of students with parental consent. Uh, what would be uh, your views on that? Is that something that you think would be worthwhile uh, looking into, that uh, schools can, in fact, uh, drug test students uh, with parental consent? You know, it's interesting. I, um, I've seen a number of news articles coming across my desk indicating that different districts are changing and different states are changing the law so that they can do that. Um, and as you know, the Supreme Court <coughs> upheld uh, drug testing of um, high school athletes in Oregon. Um, I just come at it from a little different way. I think that I would not want to spend the money, the taxpayers' money, to look for the relatively infrequent hard drug use problem in the school population until we what, if, what would you consider a hard drug well, use problem? Cocaine, opiates don't show up in I mean, any most, age group. Most, most parents, including myself, would consider any, any drug, illicit drug uses by our children fairly serious. Yeah. I'm not sure why not, it would I'm hinge, hinge it on, on a subjective interpretation of a hard drug usage. Right. I'm not saying that it isn't serious, but what I'm saying is that the, the um, primary problem is that I would want to attack first is the drug use among the kids who've been arrested because they're high risk. They're for the most part the kids who are going to develop into your uh, career criminal and their drug use, if unchecked, will go on to the heroin and cocaine. Why? I'm just curious. I'm not necessarily disagreeing. Why, why wait until it's a, a, an extremely serious, perhaps irreparable problem? Uh, and similar to the theory behind drug testing in the workplace right. uh, or in, in government offices, uh, is there not something to be said for having a deterrent effect? I think there is. There's quite a bit of evidence to support the deterrent effect of drug testing. Um, and as you may know, parents already have the right to order, uh, to buy, purchase drug tests. So if they want to test their children, no, they can. No thanks to the FDA on that. They, <laughs> uh, they were threatening criminal prosecutions right. of, uh, of parents uh, who tried to do that. Thank goodness they, they backed off on mm -hmm. that. Right. I, I just, when I compare the, the immensity of the problem in the juvenile justice population versus um, the student population where you have kids who are for the most part going to school and are doing okay, I would want to test in that high risk population before is, I would is it, spend the money. Would it have to be an either or? In other words, we see there's a problem, certainly as you've yeah. described, with, 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 with students uh, who use drugs, if not on a regular basis, uh, at least yeah. more than one time experimentally. And we know the effect that that can have on other students, certainly, mm -hmm. as, as unfortunate role models. And we're already attacking that problem. To, to some extent, maybe there, there ought to be more done to that. But why would we have to take from the attack on that problem to institute a more comprehensive, longer term program uh, and the important signal that it would send to tell 
students that uh, as long as your parents consent, you are subject to drug testing at school, and so that the school administrators and teachers know that mm -hmm. they have that uh, as, a, as a stick, so to speak, uh, in, in, in trying to keep students off drugs so that they don't be, fall into that category that you're describing. Why? Do you really see it as, as an either or? For the most part, I've been talking about this for about 10 or 15 years, and generally, politically, the question always goes back to the kid who's in school. When, you know, I see the pro that the reluctance to spend the money on the real high-risk population first. If that were taken care of, then I'd say, okay, then go on and do the other. Because it does tend to be an either or, as far as I can see it. The, the focus is on the kids in school and not if, the, if, if the we juveniles. Could, could do, but you don't have any problem with it as, as a concept. On principle, no, no, I don't think so. However, one of the, the pitfalls in using drug testing is that people see it as the answer. And really, all the drug testing does is open up the problem. So the question is, once you do the testing, what are you gonna do with, these, with the kids who test positive? What is gonna be put into place? Is it gonna be a treatment response? Is it gonna be a punitive response? That's, that's, that's a very good point. I think we ought to keep that in mind in, in all aspects of the war against drugs. For example, the recent ad campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, in my view, very, very good ads and potentially a very worthwhile component of uh, the war against drugs. Mm -hmm. One might uh, have, have preferred that you know, the administration would have done something before five and a half years, but certainly better late than never. But the value of those, similar to what you've described, the value of any component uh, really hinges on it being part of a comprehensive approach and they're, and they're having follow-up. We can't just expect that if we throw a couple of billion dollars at some nice ads that it's going to solve the problem if we're doing nothing else mm -hmm. with the other components of the drug problem. Uh, or we're not following up on those ads, and I, I think that's a very good point with regard to testing. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Vereen, when do you anticipate uh, seeing General McCaffrey next? Uh, I'll probably be on the phone with him this afternoon. Uh, Do me a favor today. if you would, and give him my, my best regards and thank him uh, on behalf of myself and I suspect a, a lot of other members of this panel, if not all of them, uh, but certainly I speak just for myself, uh, I know, know that. And thank him for his recent statements with regard to drug legalization uh, and uh, sort of dispelling the, this, this myth that some countries uh, and, and drug proponents, drug legalization proponents in this country are trying to build up. Uh, I think his statements with regard to the Netherlands and the unfortunate and very tangible uh, results of their legalization and pro-drug policies uh, are not uh, the panacea that some would, would have us think. It took a lot of courage to do that and I, and, and I compliment him for that, and I wish you would pass that on to him. Uh, with re and, and also, if you would, uh, take him a message that we, we would hope and expect, certainly, that he would take a similar approach here in this country uh, with regard to, uh, there are three states in particular, I believe, uh, on which uh, ballots, or in which ballots uh, or referenda uh, will be on the ballots uh, this year, uh, Florida, Colorado, and the District of Columbia. And if you would, please, I'd pr want to appreciate your views on this and how this ties into the overall problem that we're talking about here. And uh, is uh, your office and the director's office firmly committed uh, to speaking out against these drug legalization efforts, in particular in these three states, and will ONDCP be proactively involved in uh, making sure that message is heard across this country, and particularly in those three states, before the, the, uh, uh, the issues actually appear on the ballot? We are committed, and our commitment is very clear in our in our strategy. If I use that as a as the as, as a backdrop, um, we are relying on data, on important information. In, in fact, you you've heard from this this panel how important good data is, um, how good how important good data are, and the general was using data and looking for data to, to make meaningful comparisons between us and and, and other countries. In the area of legalization, making um, harmful substances more accessible puts our children at risk. At it's really risk. clear, at greater risk. That, that is, it, it's, it's so clear. We don't know how to make that message even clearer. That is so clear, and that's, that's what we rest. Um, um, our views on is that data that our children will be at greater risk. I don't think you can say any, anything more than that. 
Are, are you aware of what specific steps or policy statements uh, will be made uh, between now and, and the November elections, particularly with regard to those three states uh, in which uh, drug legalization will be on the ballot? Yeah, at, at this point, we are, we are working very hard to figure out how to approach that. In, in, in some of these states, the, the issues are somewhat different, and the approaches on how these things got on the ballot and how they're being pitched uh, are different. And, and um, I, I think the responses to each of the states have to be taken individually. So I'm, I'm not aware concretely of exactly how the responses to each of those states will be at this point. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Sure thing. Barrett, did you have additional questions for this panel? Mr. Micah, if you would like to raise the chair. Thank you. If you have additional Thank questions. You. Thank you for uh, assuming the chair. Uh, I'd like to ask our panel, if I may, uh, a couple more questions. First of all, uh, today we, we have... Um, had the opportunity to uh, discuss the the pie, the, the uh, all of the money that uh, drug abuse and uh, drug uh, misuse, uh, uh, illegal narcotics uh, cost uh, this nation. I think it's 16 plus billion dollars. We spend three billion dollars plus on treatment. I don't think there's anyone on this panel or anyone in the Congress that thinks we should spend less on drug treatment uh, or any other element uh, uh, in this uh, effort to, to stem the drug problem in our nation. Uh, the question whether it's uh, education, interdiction, enforcement, or uh, today uh, treatment is whether that is in fact uh, effective and whether we're uh, getting uh, r good results uh, for the uh, hard-earned taxpayer dollars that we're spending. I, I think you get a unanimous vote on uh, doubling the treatment amount or quadrupling it if we could um, show uh, hard uh, information uh, that uh, the programs were successful. Uh, today's hearing, we've heard um, and your report, which was released in, uh, in March of this year, GAO says the research, research shows treatment is effective, but benefits may be overstated. And again, from our own general accounting office, that um, much of the uh, data is inconclusive, uh, that we base uh, some of our funding on uh, on a uh, questionable uh, testing or analysis uh, program, not uh, using really hard uh, drug testing, but uh, self-reporting uh, and a program that uh, relies on, um, uh, I guess, 56% of the subjects in the program were on parole. Uh, I, I'm a little bit concerned about that because uh, if we had uh, uh, criminals uh, doing self-reporting, I think that the uh, amount of crime in this country would be dramatically uh, reduced. And this is, as you had, had stated, uh, uh, Dr. Lily Blanton, uh, a criminal uh, or illegal activity in, in many instances, uh, uh, again, using uh, illegal narcotics. Uh, uh, so that really brings me to a question of what is successful? Where should we be putting money? Now, uh, it's my understanding that uh, the bulk of the federal dollars go through HHS. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. About uh, half. Yes? About half. About half. About a little over half. Uh -huh. Do we have any measure of, uh, of asking from the agency uh, or requiring that any programs that are funding by the agency a uh, success uh, uh, percentage. Uh, uh, is there any measure of uh, success, uh, any way to, to gauge uh, if this money is directed to programs that are in fact successful? Uh, Dr. Lily Blatt. Well, let me explain that of the money that's gone, that uh, is spent by HHS, um, most of that 
is block grant funds to the states through the substance abuse treatment prevention and treatment block grant and in about 1981 we changed the requirements for reporting and we in allowing states to be more flexible in how they use their dollars we also um, have not been as defined and we have not defined as precisely so we've been pretty loose with the we've, th we've, it, there is a tension between the flexibility we give states and the accountability that we require of states because we're allowing them to spend their dollars on programs that they define as meeting the needs of their communities we are being a little more prescriptive in what information we are requesting now of the block grant but that so we, is very new we might uh, look at uh, adopting some measure of of uh, success and then also we've heard we that uh, some hard testing um, uh, should be a component to really uh, determine whether or not we're getting accurate uh, results is that correct right no that certainly could be a requirement uh, that you all that Congress could place okay. for receipt of block grant funds now there are a couple other areas where we spend a lot of money I think the second biggest area is the VA right and uh, do we have any way of measuring success in the VA program? No, and let me also explain that with the VA dollars, what we are reporting are treatment dollars as well as funds for medical care. We cannot disaggregate the other kinds of medical care that persons with a substance abuse problem and are in the VA system have. Are you asking, or do we ask the agency uh, for some uh, measure of uh, success or how those dollars are spent, Dr. Vereen, are you, is your office into this at all? Uh, yes, we are. But in the case of the, the VA, one of the problems is that it is hard to disaggregate some of those those numbers. In, in, the, in the general area of treatment, um, we've tried to provide some leadership by taking the goals that we've established in the strategy and attaching to those goals specific performance measures so that we know how close we are to getting to um, the goals of getting more folks into treatment, for example. We know that when we look at treatment models that try to really engage people into treatment, keep them in treatment, and make sure that they graduate the treatment, we're finding better, or we're trying to find better ways um, to, to measure how that's actually done. And then once we find a good way to do that, and some states have taken some leadership in this, we try to take that information and feed it back uh, to other states. So well, HHS is involved in assessing what these states are doing with their block grant funding. Well, we have uh, uh, passed a measure, I believe, in the House, and it's pending in the Senate. We need the drug SARS uh, support for it to require a little bit more accountability mm -hmm. and a, a little bit more uh, uh, definite uh, uh, return on the dollars invested from the VA programs. It's very important. I yes. mean, our, our veterans population has a problem um, in this area and uh, it's, it's very important too if the programs aren't successful that we look at uh, what programs are successful, support them. So we need your uh, cooperation on that. The other, uh, we've talked about, those are two areas uh, where we spend a big amount of bucks. Another area where we have sort of a captive audience is our prison population. We've talked about that a little bit today. Do we have any, uh, well, prisoners are pretty much, as I said, a captive audience. Uh, our, most of our uh, programs, they're uh, t uh, uh, testing based. Uh, are we testing them in prison and then when they get out of prison on uh, probation programs? Do you know, Dr. Breen? Yes, a, a, a number of the studies do combine um, the self-report measures with um, biological measures. Urine testing is the, is the main one. Uh, there's no requirement, study. though, that a federal prisoner in particular who's had a drug problem or offense uh, is required uh, to come back for drug testing. Is there on, while on probation? I'm not aware of any requirements per se. Um, but the most successful programs certainly employ those kinds of measures to supplement the other information they're getting so that they can monitor 
monitoring how these folks do um, is a very important part, not only of the program that they're in, because they need to feedback that information to the individual so that they can apply uh, the requisite sanction uh, if, if they've fallen off the wagon, so to speak. Um, well, again, we have a captive audience. We heard Dr. Sattel testify today that, that when you have leverage and then when you have strict mm -hmm. accountability and uh, you, you get results. And Dr. Wish, uh, I think, is also uh, familiar with the, uh, with the uh, Vietnam study. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and, uh, uh, and, and uh, was that successful or uh, what happened with that study? Um, that was a, a, a very different population of people that were um, basically um, followed up a random sample of um, an army enlisted men who were returning to the United States in 1971 from um, Vietnam were uh, followed up in the early 70s. And that study showed um, very dramatic results, very different from what had ever been shown before in this country with regard to the course of addiction. Basically, um, almost all of the people who had become addicted in Vietnam to an opiate when they came back to the United States um, were found to remit from dependence with or without treatment. And it's always been, been um, a question of why in this population was there such a remission from dependence when every study that had been done in the United States with people coming through treatment, there was a tremendous amount of, of relapse. And no one really has the, the um, total answer to that. It could be um, that the veterans learned the drug use in Vietnam, and when they came home, they went back to their families and to, to um, their communities, and they weren't used to getting drugs there, and they didn't have them as much available. Um, it could also be that the type of person who went into Vietnam um, was very different from the type of people we used to seeing in the big city treatment facilities because as you recall during the draft you couldn't be drafted if you for instance were a felony offender so that the type of people who were going through uh, the service at that time in Vietnam had were more likely to be um, educated and to have jobs and have a different type of history than the people who who um, we've study traditionally in drug treatment outcome studies. So I'm not clear how to make the link to mm -hmm. everything else. Well, yeah. uh, as an example, just citing it today as another uh, example, mm -hmm. I think Dr. Sattel had also referred to uh, uh, residential, the need for increased residential programs, which would also create a new environmental setting. Uh, sometimes these programs, I think, are expensive. That was a little bit different uh, illustration and example. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, again, uh, sometimes the treatment, uh, maybe if it is more, uh, uh, more environmentally um, uh, different and uh, uh, sometimes uh, those programs also cost, uh, may cost us uh, more, but if they're more effective. Mm -hmm. Again, I think we're looking today at uh, what's effective. I, there's no price tag. Uh, that uh, we can't meet if we can find programs that are effective. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to my last question. Uh, we've talked about uh, prisoners, we've talked about veterans, uh, we've talked about money through HHS and other programs. Uh, m my uh, opening comments dealt uh, with the, the, the problems we're having with our young people and the dramatic rise in uh, drug abuse, uh, Ill illegal narcotics with our young people. And I'm wondering um, if um, there are any programs that we're looking at uh, that we have hard evidence. We've heard a little bit about some state programs. We've heard about some uh, uh, faith-based programs. Uh, are there any really uh, good uh, programs coming on the horizon for our teens? And I think there was also testimony, Dr. Wish, uh, I think you said get them early. Uh, and uh, we eliminate a lot of problems, but we're even finding with young people that have abuse that 
it's it's very difficult to find uh, successful uh, programs uh, and to get a good uh, uh, rate uh, uh, of successful uh, treatment. So my final question to all of you is: Do you uh, have any ideas of how we can uh, best uh, direct our federal dollars uh, towards our, our teen and youth uh, problem, Dr. Green? Yes, uh, I should first mention that the. The media campaign that was was launched just a couple of weeks ago um, is certainly one of the first steps. Um, it's important to change the attitudes of young people before they even get close to drugs. Uh, we know that that attitude against drugs is linked to their actual use, uh, and it's also linked to their sense of how dangerous drugs are. So that if they get the information about how dangerous drugs are they're less likely to use. And our goal is to delay their, uh, the point at which they're uh, tempted. But that media campaign is attached to something really important, and that's a development of, of or, or the strengthening of communities against drugs. The development of community coalitions. All kids live in the context of a family and a community. And supporting those communities mm -hmm. and um, supporting the values that go along with resisting uh, drugs is, is, is very important. As far as specific interventions, you're aware of drug courts. We're just beginning to evaluate the effectiveness of drug courts. They're very important in, in um, having an effect on those folks who are addicted and um, uh, get into trouble in the criminal justice system. Um, they do have a captive audience, as you, as you put it, and uh, the early uh, data uh, suggest that um, there is a good return for the dollar there. There are, there are also juvenile drug courts that are just starting to emerge. Um, there are 37 at this point. And the preliminary evidence suggests that they are as success, successful, if not more successful, uh, in terms of curbing uh, drug-taking behavior and criminal behavior in that younger set. Um, and we're awaiting anxiously um, more data to support um, uh, those positive um, results. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lily Blanton. Let me just say that in our review, I would say that services and research for adolescents was certainly a gap in the portfolio of services and research and research on, on the treatment ad for adolescent adolescents. treatment programs. Right, was something certain, we should look at. Were was a gap in our okay um, in the portfolio of the Department of Health and Human Services. I would say that they realize that and are making efforts to correct some of the imbalance. And some of the reason for the imbalance has to do with what we're seeing now is a new rise in drug use among mm -hmm. adolescents. And so it's not a problem that really was high on the radar screen. But that's something that is very much changing. Um, one of the things that will become available in 1999 are results from a follow-up study from the Drug Abuse Treatment Outcome of about 3,000 adolescents in 30 programs in six cities. That will be one of the first, most objective information that we have about what works best for adolescents. And is that also self-reporting? It probably will be self-reporting because DATOS has also done a subsample where they validate, verify the self-report with some objective measures. <coughs> it's conceivable that they will do that with the adolescent population as they have done with the adult population, but I don't know for certain. But what this will at least provide us is some beginning information about the effectiveness of treatment on a national basis, which then could be used to help direct federal dollars. Because it's difficult to direct federal dollars to new programs if you don't have some sense about what programs work best. So this will help. What I also want to mention is that from our review of the literature, it seems that family-based therapy is being identified as the most promising approach. But even that approach has not shown itself consistently to be more effective than some of the other approaches that are being used. Thank you. Um, it would be good if we could get a little sampling of some hard uh, testing data uh, uh, in the teen area, too. And right. uh, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a captive population, but we have a 
population that I think we could uh, uh, look at uh, uh, some uh, some measure of uh, uh, tests, uh, drug tests that are done and see what the results are and compare them to the self-reporting. Dr. Vereen, just one thing on the ad uh, program. Uh, I, I've supported that. I, I had a different measure, uh, measure before Congress, which was to increase the declining public service requirements since the public owns the airwaves uh, and every year there are fewer and fewer PSAs on television that we increase that requirement and I hope we'll work on that so it's not just taxpayers buying more uh, TV uh, money. The other thing too uh, that I hope you'll look at is uh, uh, this the, the issue of using the media. Uh, if you talk to any political salt consultant or anyone that sells soap or dog food, they'll tell you you need saturation to be effective and you're talking two, three thousand television rating points and you're also talking about targeting audiences, young people and others. Some of what I've seen so far is nice but I'm not sure if it's effective and I hope we're going to uh, see some test areas where it's targeted where it's saturation where uh, we also are measuring the results. Uh, I've also seen the ads in some of the newspapers are great but I don't see too many teens reading the Washington Times or the Post or some of these other publications and those are some of our target uh, uh, groups. Uh, just those comments. Dr. Sattel, uh, anything in the teen area? Just <clears throat> two things. One is to emphasize the promise of the juvenile drug courts and the other is uh, also a call for, um, again, residential treatment because what that focuses on for adolescents as well, basically focuses on socialization. And uh, that's extremely important, but it's intensive. So that, that can be a very useful intervention as well. Thank you. Dr. Wish? You know, if I may deviate for one second, urine drug testing is so inexpensive, it's 10 to $20 to test for the most of the drugs we're talking about. When you compare that to do one of these large studies with an interview, it may cost anywhere from $300 up. So it's a very small amount. It's very hard for me to understand why urine specimens aren't collected at all of these research studies. Government studies. can usually find the more expensive way to do it. <laughs> Now, the second, second point is I know we've all heard that advertisement, uh, pay now or pay later. I think that in terms of the way we approach the criminal justice system and drug use, we're more likely to pay later. We don't want to pay now. I would recommend universal drug testing of juvenile detainees at admission and post-release, coupled with programs of intervention and prevention and treatment. Thank you. Dr. Suchek. We at Haymarket do not do adolescent treatment. Um, I had been involved with a program that did do adolescent treatment, and um, it's a very difficult uh, issue to address. We do believe that um, treatment does work, uh, that in fact people coming into treatment may relapse, uh, may deny their usage, uh, but we also believe that seeds are planted. And there are literally in this country millions of people recovering that have many, many years of recovery, sobriety, and, and clean through uh, treatment programs and self-help groups that I think are, are not being studied and, and not being uh, questioned about, uh, you know, how long they've been uh, sober and clean and how productive they've become in terms of uh, uh, citizens of this country. Uh, as it relates to, to adolescents, I, I uh, I would like to, to mention that the problem that I saw when I was doing um, interventions with adolescents and their families was that many of the adolescents got some of their best highs right out of the home itself, uh, from the medicine cabinet, from the liquor department. And our society, uh, you know, we, we put limitations on um, uh, alcohol purchases by adolescents, and yet, I don't know if this panel is aware of it, but the new uh, hand washes that these uh, that are on the market today contain about 90% uh, ethyl alcohol, which is the kind you drink. Now, a kid can walk into any drugstore, purchase a small bottle of that, mix it with some soda or something, or even they're even flavored, as a matter of fact, or some peppermint uh, smelling kinds of things and can get a buzz that you would not, uh, not believe. It's, it's a, we're talking about 160, 180 proof alcohol being mixed in there. 
And uh, my experience with adolescents when I was doing it back in the mid-80s is that kids knew this. They knew this about NyQuil. They knew this about cough syrups that were on the market uh, and would come in not only the inf under the influence of marijuana, cocaine, but uh, a lot of them would come in under the influence of prescription drugs right out of mom and dad's medicine cabinets or from purchases that they made at the drugstore of common cough syrups. Well, I want to uh, thank each of our panelists uh, today for their uh, testimony, for their participation, and uh, for their willingness to uh, help us find solutions to a very difficult uh, problem facing our country, and particularly as we ended on the note of our young people. Uh, we will have additional questions uh, from other panelists and from uh, myself. Uh, and we will leave uh, without objection the record open for an additional 10 days. So I will dismiss you at this time and uh, thank you for your participation. I'd like to call our second panel uh, the, today. Our second panel today uh, starts with Mr. Brian Hill, who's the president of the American uh, Jail Association and uh, warden of, the, of Monroe County, Pennsylvania Correctional Facility. Uh, Mr. Arthur Pratt is uh, President of Life Effectiveness Training. Uh, Dr. Douglas Lipton is a Senior uh, Research Fellow with the National Development and Research Institute. And Dr. Faye uh, Taxman is an Associate Research Professor at the University of uh, Maryland. I'd like to welcome each of our second uh, uh, panelist members uh, today. As I uh, informed uh, our first panel, this is an investigations and oversight subcommittee of uh, the United States uh, House of Representatives. And in that uh, regard, we do swear in all of our witnesses. So if I could ask uh, for you to stand, if you would, to you raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. The witnesses answered in the uh, affirmative. And again, I'm pleased and delighted that we have uh, uh, your participation in this important subject, uh, trying to find out what uh, drug treatment programs are effective, trying to determine how we should best spend our federal tax dollars and uh, where the emphasis of this Congress should be in uh, supporting successful uh, treatment programs. Uh, again, uh, I mentioned to our other panelists that we will put lengthy statements uh, in the record if uh, you so desire additional material upon request, but we ask you to try to limit your uh, oral uh, comments to the panel to uh, five minutes, and we will also uh, reserve questions uh, until all panelists have uh, testified. Uh, with that, uh, again, I'd like to welcome Mr. Brian Hill, uh, President of the American Jail Association, uh, and uh, he's also a warden at the Monroe County, Pennsylvania Correctional Facility. Welcome, uh, Mr. Hill, and you're recognized, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my testimony is a brief of my written testimony, and I ask that uh, it be made part of the record. Without objection, and also uh, all other additional statements uh, of this panel will be made uh, part of the record. Thank you. The American Jail Association's main mission is to support the professionals who work in and operate America's jails. Jails are considered by many as not being fundamentally different from prisons. However, jails are characteristically set apart from prisons by their differences. For instance, most jail professionals recognize that average daily population is not a true indicator of the length of time the average inmate spends in jail. The reality of jail population dynamics are such that a majority of inmates are released within a very short period of time, most of whom make bail or are released on their own recognizance. The still very large number of inmates remaining in custody will do so for weeks, months, and even years. The use of averages works well for prison populations, but are irrelevant in jail decision making. Unfortunately, many in jail programmatic opportunities, including substance abuse treatment, are dismissed because of the reliance by decision makers on using average length of stay as an indicator of the number of inmates who might be amenable 
to drug treatment in a jail setting. Jails, for the most part, house inmates who are pretrial or serving sentences of less than one year. We are, however, finding that in addition to their less than one year inmates, jails are beginning to take on the responsibilities that traditionally have been left to prisons. Jails offer an opportunity to address substance abuse upstream of the problem. An inmate who is incarcerated in prison has been on the merry-go-round of continuously reoffending, being rearrested, and being reincarcerated over and over again. The question could be posed, where can we have the greatest effect? At the prison level, where an offender now a felon has most likely been in and out of jail a dozen or two times and has become part of the criminal culture, or at the jail level, when the first time nonviolent offender hears the doors of the jail slam behind him for the first time. Jails offer a unique opportunity for community linkage. This not only includes a continuation of treatment upon release, but the ability to partner with local agencies for the provision of education, treatment, vocation, industries, job, and life skills before, during, and after a period of incarceration. The experiences of many jurisdictions throughout the country have resulted in a great deal of practical knowledge and proved some previously held assumptions with regard to drug treatment in jails. We now know that drug treatment is an effective vehicle for helping to prevent offenders from returning to chronic patterns of substance abuse and crime. We know that drug treatment does work if it is implemented properly. We know that in addition to the necessity of substance abuse treatment programs in jails, that a continuum of, of care in the community is essential. We know that the jail setting offers an opportunity for abstinence. We know that abstinence affords the inmates an opportunity to begin not only addressing their substance abuse problem, but their own physical, emotional, and spiritual deficits which they may be experiencing. We know that communities benefit because treatment offers an opportunity to intervene in the inmate cycle of dependency by providing detoxification, medical and psychological stabilization, and so forth. We know that success is accomplished through a commitment to follow participants for a reasonable period of time after the program participation has been completed. Also important to a successful drug treatment program is ensuring that there is no availability of drugs in the correctional facility. In order to do this, a policy of zero tolerance must be adopted. We know that the more successful zero tolerance programs include drug testing that generally subjects inmates to frequent, random, and targeted drug testing. Inmates who test positive for drugs must receive swift, fair, and appropriate sanctions. This demonstrates to the inmates involved and others in the jail that the facility is serious in its efforts to be drug free. Thank you for this opportunity to provide input to this subcommittee. We are missing the opportunity of a lifetime to make a positive impact on crime rates, arrest rates, and incarceration rates by ignoring the power of grassroots community abilities at addressing the nation's drug and alcohol problems. We simply cannot wait until an offender has been accustomed to the criminal justice system and in fact has become part of that culture. Jails with the proper resources and in the hands of jail professionals and community agencies represent our best chance at tackling the substance abuse problem upstream. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, Mr. Pratt, if you would please proceed to uh, summarize uh, your testimony and uh, I would remind you again uh, that uh, all the witnesses' full statements, uh, whether they read them in their entirety or not, will be included in the record. Yes, I've included with my uh, remarks a summary of five studies of uh, drug alcohol treatment programs in county jails throughout the country, and you have uh, that evidence on hand. <clears throat> and my remarks have a lot to do with that because uh, we have um, chosen a specific goal. That goal was uh, what was the results two years after treatment of 90-day treatment programs in county jails. I want to tell you about studies that give strong evidence that drug alcohol treatment greatly reduces recidivism in county jails. In 1981, a $30,000 study by Dr. Brian Vargas of our substance abuse program 
in the Marion County Jail, Indianapolis, shows that 47% of the inmates <coughs> um, <coughs> treated did not return to jail three to five years after treatment. Uh, I'll mention that this was not a self-reported program. Uh, Dr. Vargas sent out Indiana University students to call on these people and their families and subs substantiate what had happened to them. <coughs> A control group of the same sort of addicted inmates not treated showed 74 percent had returned to jail. This is a 27 percent reduction in arrests due to treatment. In 1997, <clears throat> study of the same program in Indianapolis showed 66 percent reduction in recidivism two years after treatment. We have submitted to you a summary of four other studies of 90-day treatment programs in Portland, Oregon, Montgomery County, Maryland, Chicago, Alexandria, Virginia, done largely by PhDs, comparing the persons treated with control groups of not treated persons, <coughs> and showing an average of 54% reduction in recidivism two years after treatment. Since these are repeat offenders <clears throat> arrested three to 12 times in the last few years, these statistics reflect really massive reduction in arrests. For example, in Indianapolis, we treated Bill P. in 1978. He had already been arrested 53 times for drunkenness offenders, offenses. Since treatment, he has been sober and never arrested again. He has a good job, a wife, and two children. He could have been arrested another 53 more times without treatment. I'll also mention George P., who was treated in, 90, uh, in 79. Uh, he is now sober 19 years. Uh, he's been uh, a professor at Indiana University and is a Methodist minister. <clears throat> Let's consider financial savings. Of the 183 persons studied last year in Indianapolis, 66 percent, or 120, had not been rearrested since their treatment in 1995. So we saved 120 arrests in that period of time. At $6,000 arrest, and that includes court costs, 90 days confinement, and probation, we saved $720,000 on arrests in one year at the cost of $43,000 for our treatment program, which was largely done by part-time persons and volunteers. <clears throat> the Portland study showed a saving of $760,000. <clears> if drug alcohol treatment had been in the 2,000 major county jails in the, co in the country at this time, the savings and consequent reductions in crime would have been enormous. Why is such treatment in county jails so effective? First, because of the courts mandating treatment for 90 days and following up for at least a year, they have clients long enough to get them away from their compulsive habits and drug gangs, giving them opportunity to form new habits and make new friends. Follow-up must include random drug testing. Now, uh, it's completely true that if you ask persons what drugs they've been on, if you try to have interviews with persons, many of them are very afraid of telling you that they've been on drugs because uh, they will be in, indicting themselves. So, Random drops are very important in really studying this, but they're even more important in respect to the recovery of the individual. Because as Dr. Sattel had said, uh, this is a crisis of the will in addiction. And when the will is reinforced by the courts who are saying in effect, yes, you must have this and you must have random drug testing, it reinforces the person's ability to stay sober. It's an instrument of treatment, uh, not simply an instrument of study. So the funding, the 45 million that the government is putting into drug testing is very important in the success of treatment. <clears throat> Follow-up must include random drug testing. 
This pressure serves as a fence against drug alcohol. So the use of mandating power is at the heart of our success in county jails. The private field of treatment, hospitals and clinics, frequently do not have the insurance funds to keep addicts in treatment 90 days, nor the legal power to mandate drug testing after treatment, and therefore could hardly be anticipated to achieve the results of jail and prison programs. We advocate a study of comparative effectiveness of mandatory versus non-mandatory programs. Secondly, in the county jails, <clears throat> we get them when they're young, often 17 years old, and can help to redirect them to education, jobs, and better family relationships before they go to state prisons. Uh, I've had them at 13 years old. Uh, I have done uh, groups with 13-year-old. Their response is excellent. Senator Luger's bill 1876 and Representative Burton's bill 4039 currently in the Senate and House mandate jail-based substance abuse treatment for a minimum of 90 days with one year after care. They appropriate no new funding but mandate 10 percent of the funding for drug alcohol treatment in state prisons to go to the county jails a minimal expense to start a dynamic initiative against crime. And we find that at least half of our persons are involved in other kinds of crimes as well as drugs and alcohol, stealing, prostitution. Um, it is hard to imagine the effect that, start, that starting a drug alcohol treatment program has on the morale of the enforcers of the criminal justice system at the local level. Imagine how police feel locking up the same prisoners time after time. 85% of the 13 million persons sent yearly to the county jails are recidivists on drug alcohol offenses. When we established drug alcohol treatment in the Indianapolis jail in 1969, within a few years, we also had a GED program, case workers, job placement, a work release center, and then a follow-up home detention program. We had taken the initiative against crime. In Monticello, Indiana, when, when I trained the Sheriff's Department in drug alcohol treatment, Colonel Ernie Turner soon had Monticello... Excuse me, Mr. Open. Mr. Pratt, if, if I could very respectfully urge you to uh, sort of move forward fairly quickly so that um, we can give the other panelists a chance you, to uh, present their important points and then at least sufficient time for questions. I'm just about done. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Ernie Turner soon had Monticello Sheriff's Department clearing White County of marijuana. They are really waging a war on drugs. We must, I repeat, must give the county jail sheriff's departments the power to take the initiative against drugs. Talk about taking the initiative to restore positive morality in America. We are doing it. In treatment, we role play out family conflicts and encourage fathers to make the decisions to support their kids, boyfriends to marry their live-in girlfriends, and marry couples not to divorce. We encourage forgiveness of self and others. One-fourth of our clients get their GEDs. We ask our clients to choose their own way back from addiction, whether it be AA, Narcotics Anonymous, Church, Rational Recovery, or their own programs. We bond easily with our clients because we really listen to them and are willing to admit our own faults and addictions. We also confront them with their faults and addictions. In short, we are the spearhead of a sort of a spiritual movement that brings hope for a second chance to many young men and women who never had a first chance. For the sake of God and the common man, Please support Senator Luger and Representatives Burton's legislation. The American Jail Association, the National Council on Alcoholism, and the National Association of Counties, who know the catastrophe of addiction, are supporting these bills as well. Thank you, Mr. Pratt. Uh, Dr. Lipton. Well, thank you for inviting me to testify about correctional treatment that works, and uh, I'm enthused about this, and I hope you catch some of the optimism that I feel. Addiction treatment is obviously a critical component 
of the nation's war on drugs and the incarceration of persons who have been found guilty of various crimes who are also chronic drug users uh, presents a propitious opportunity for treatment. It's propitious because these persons would be very unlikely to seek treatment on their own and without treatment they are extremely likely to continue their drug use and their criminal careers after release. And now we have, I am pleased to say, uh, an effective uh, series of technologies to uh, treat with them while they're in custody and to alter their lifestyles. I feel genuinely optimistic regarding our ability to effectively treat people who are normally deemed by conventional wisdom to be uh, irredeemable or very high risk, namely the chronic heroin and cocaine users with extensive predatory criminal histories that we all fear. The high rate addict offenders such as these commit 40 to 60 robberies a year, 70 to 100 burglaries a year, more than 4,000 drug transactions a year, and we have reliable evidence from, and I'll cite the studies to you, that have substantiated a consistent reduction in recidivism after treatment during incarceration plus after care. This reduction has been remarkably in the field of social science very consistent across these five studies in the range of about 25 percent between those treated and those in comparison groups. That is a difference like 75 percent success versus 50 percent success for those who have no treatment. This is a substantial and tangible improvement in their behavior and consequently for our quality of life. And I want to describe, I could describe to you, it's all in my remarks about the specific findings in these studies. Uh, but I, I want to first make it very clear that as a researcher, and I've been involved in this process since 1963, uh, I'm a professional skeptic. Uh, I was a contributor perhaps to the uh, most important document, The Effectiveness of Correctional Treatment, which came out in 75. Uh, as the senior author of that document, which uh, for whatever damnation you may throw at me, uh, said that relatively little works. So I come from a standpoint of, of examining these data objectively and, and carefully, yet here I stand uh, saying to you that I see successful outcomes. I see successful outcomes for correctional programs which uh, as sustained over time and across projects with groups of offenders who are otherwise highly likely to relapse to drugs and return to crime, it makes me sit up at least and, and certainly take notice and to report to you these results which have now been uh, remarkably substantiated in study after study with different populations. Uh, I, I convey to you my conviction that prison-based treatment for drug offenders works. Uh, the, the studies that I've, I've been referring to, the Stay and Out Project, uh, the Cornerstone Project in Oregon, Staying Out is in New York, Amity Donovan in California, the New Vision Project in Texas, and the Key Crest Program in Delaware. Uh, research demonstrates that these prison-based therapeutic communities that include aftercare programs have been markedly successful with drug-abusing offenders. I also want to share with you, uh, in this very brief period, some preliminary findings from a four-year study that we've just completed. This study, the Correctional Drug Abuse Treatment Evaluation Project, or CDATE, began in 1994 with funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. It, was, uh, it is a comprehensive, detailed review of the evaluation research on the effectiveness of criminal justice-based intervention programs for offenders in any form of custody. It's a meta-analysis of all published and unpublished research gathered from 1968 until 1997. And it, we pulled together over 10,000 documents. There are 1,600 studies in this database that I'll be reporting very briefly to you. And it is a, a, just 30 years since the closeout of those studies uh, that we, we did in that first book I referred to earlier, The Effectiveness of Correctional Treatment. We have sought out all credible evaluations, adult and juvenile, drug abusing and non-drug abusing alike, and examine them with the intention of informing policy and practice in the most meaningful way. Uh, now, without going into detail about each of the program's findings, let me just assure you that the results 
are uh, clear, robust, and uh, consistent over time. Uh, the results, for example, uh, with untreated controls, with reincarceration being the outcome variable in the experiments that we did in, in, uh, in Amity and Donovan Prison in California, uh, the untreated controls did about the same, 50-50. 50 percent 50. 50 reincarcerated, 50 percent not reincarcerated. With the therapeutic community and aftercare, uh, the success rate was 91.8 percent after one year following parole as of mid-1995. Uh, that's 91.8 percent success and reincarceration two years following parole was 86 uh, percent success for that same group as compared to only 32 percent success for the controls. Uh, the si similar percentages have been achieved in uh, all of these and please note that I said plus aftercare. Uh, one of the strategic elements in treatment is not just ending the treatment at the gate of the prison, but continuing in the, in the community for at least uh, a year, perhaps as much as 18 months. These uh, individuals who've been through these programs, chronic heroin and cocaine users for the most part, and indeed in, in, Dolov in Donovan, uh, about 15% were, were there for uh, murder or very, very serious uh, assault offenses. Uh, there were about 40% who had some kind of violent offense. So here we have an approach which not only works with drug abuse, but also with violent offending. Um, now, we're talking about an appropriate intervention used and applied over a sufficient duration. And with that sufficient duration and adequate treatment, continued with aftercare, three out of four are going to succeed, re-enter the community, and subsequently lead a socially acceptable life. Now, the study C date, which has been pulling together all of this other research, uh, we've got uh, 27 studies of, of TCs, and there's a consistent, now this is with all TCs from all over the world, uh, and uh, that have been researched carefully, and we have carefully looked at the research methods to exclude those studies which are flawed, and uh, we conclude uh, an average effect size of 17 percent uh, for TCs across all TCs, English TCs, German TCs, as well as American TCs. Um, now, let me just contrast that with uh, correctional boot camps, uh, where the, uh, we've looked at 107 studies of incarceration and punishment programs. Now, the overall mean effect size for those kinds of programs is zero. That means that you just might as well not do it. I mean, it's for, because it has the same results as no treatment. Um, what happens when we focus on boot camps? We have 24 programs or boot camps, uh, called boot camps, and uh, the average effect size is 0 0.04, which is equivalent to a 4% difference between experimental group and control group, no treatment group. The one method which jumps out from all of our research, and we've looked at over 150 treatment methods, is cognitive behavioral and social learning uh, training. Training in social skills, training in problem solving and avoiding thinking errors, training in self-control, anger management, and other social learning and cognitive behavioral training. We've annotated uh, 54 studies of cognitive behavioral social learning programs the average effect size is 0.13, which is a 13% difference. Now, let's make sure that we understand that there's a real difference in the nature of the populations that these uh, methods have been applied to. The TCs that I were talking about have been applied to the most serious, most difficult offenders, the predatory cocaine heroin users. Cognitive skills has been applied much more broadly, not only to drug abusers, but to non-drug abusers as well. And it is the most consistent uh, type of treatment in terms of positive outcomes. And far, far dominant are the number of treatment programs, and far more consistent is their results in terms of reducing uh, recidivism. And their studies are better in, ter in terms of the degree of confidence we can have in the outcome. So, 
I think this can give you some clues as to where perhaps the best investments ought to be made of congressional dollars, of tax dollars. The, uh, uh, the degree to which we can be sure about this is relatively high. And most social scientists, as you know, don't go around talking about a great deal of confidence. They talk about equivocation for the most part. Having been one for a long time, I can tell you that. But nevertheless, the majority of the studies clearly point to positive outcomes, which makes me feel very confident that we have technologies that work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lipton. Dr. Taxman, uh, if you would uh, back clean up for us and uh, uh, briefly uh, summarize the, the key elements of your testimony, and then we'll uh, have questions of the panel. All right. Thank, thank you, thank Doctor. You. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you almost 20 years of work in field research in the area of criminal justice uh, treatment for criminal justice offenders, um, and some recent work that I've also done in uh, providing um, and evaluating services for substance abusers within the community context. What I want to do this morning is talk about, start from the basis that we have a body of knowledge now that suggests that treatment is very effective. And my, as my colleagues this morning have discussed, you know, a number of studies, albeit with some methodological limitations, continues to show that we can get great benefits to the individual and society from um, using treatment and prevention technologies. The thing that, that I guess causes questions to yourselves and others is this notion of how do we institutionalize the good results that happen within studies? How do we make programs work better in the general framework of how they're delivered in our communities, um, whether that community be in the jail or in a prison or under um, supervision or for different types of populations, whether it be moms who are users, whether it be um, you know people within, involved in the criminal justice system, um, young adults. That's the real question, and my research of late has focused on looking at the systemic aspects of how systems work and how we can put in place responsive systems of care. And I hope that you will consider this, because I think one of the things that we often do is assume that if we provide a program, we're going to solve all these problems. And, and as you probably know better than myself, there are no silver, silver bullets in many situations in life. And this is one situation with an addicted population where we have to begin to look at how we put in place a system. Because one of the things with an addicted population is that you have manipulative behavior. You have behaviors of people who do not want to change and often cannot see how their problems have caused problems for themselves and those around. And as Dr. Vereen talked about, this is not only a problem in addictions, it's also problems in other lifestyle um, diseases or disorders like diabetes or asthma. Um, so the question is, how do we institutionalize it? And I've provided for a paper for you that I did for the Office of National Drug Control Policy, um, and I've done some summary points that I hope you include as part of the record, um, but I really want to summarize four different points because I know time is short today. I also want to talk about how I am drawing upon mostly the experience with criminal justice populations, but as I've been working with the public health treatment community, the same principles can apply in other settings. And in fact, I can share with you some pilots that are going on in Montgomery County, Maryland right now that uh, deal with welfare moms and mothers under um, child protective orders that actually use these same four principles. <clears throat> to begin with, we must look at our treatment system. We have a very fragmented treatment system. Most programs exist on a shoestring. Most programs are episodic. The Hayward program that was discussed earlier is a unique type of program in the sense that it has multiple levels of care. In surveys that we have done in the public health community, we find, and this is repeated in the DATO studies that um, you're obviously aware of, that the majority of programs are outpatient programs that are three to six months in duration. What that generally means is you have someone who has an addictive disorder who is going to an outpatient clinic one to two times a week um, for a very short period of time. And we are asking people within those settings to begin to address their problems. 
the reason that residential programs are attractive, the reason that things called intensive outpatient programs are attractive is because they offer the opportunity to provide more structure and to help someone re-socialize and relearn how to live a life without criminal behavior or without substance abuse. Um, but that is not how the public health systems in most cities and jurisdictions operate. They operate in an episodic program that basically someone goes into a short period of time. What we see and what you're concerned about, rightfully so, is the fact that we have high dropout rates in these types of programs. They don't engage people. People don't stay with the program. Um, as part of one of the projects that I'm involved in, um, which actually this committee um, has, provides support, is the Washington Baltimore HIDA. We have a treatment component that has put in place a continuum of care. And the continuum of care concept is the same concept that Dr. Lipton talked about, of this notion of keeping people in treatment for an extended period of time in multiple phases. It can work from jail to the community. It can work from prison to the community. It can work within a community setting for people under probation or child protective orders in which people are engaged in treatment for a longer period of time. Um, what we have found in the Washington Baltimore Haida project where they have instituted in 12 jurisdictions this notion of a continuum for offenders that have an average of nine prior rearrests and five prior convictions um, we have an 85 percent retention rate in treatment which is remarkable because these offenders have had prior histories of dropouts. We've also seen a very significant reduction in their probability of rearrest. Um, I can share with you another study that we've done, <clears throat> that I've actually done in jails, and they mimic the, some of the studies that Dr. Lipton talked about, about the importance of the continuum. <clears throat> Excuse me. But essentially, <clears throat> what we have found is when you have jail-based program with aftercare, you can reduce the rearrest rates by almost 50 percent. And that's very critical as we begin, you particularly, begin to think about, you know, <clears throat> the residential substance abuse um, block grant dollars, which limit the funding only to prison environments and do not provide communities with the ability to use some of those funds for those offenders. Um, so the treatment system is an area in which more accountability is needed and, I, and more accountability needed in terms of forcing system changes. And I actually applaud efforts that um, everyone is undertaking right now to develop performance measures because I think over time that can really improve the quality of services. Another area that I want to talk about briefly is the area of criminal justice leverage. You've heard a lot about leverage this morning. Um, the question is, is we all talk about coerced treatment, but no one really knows what coerced treatment is. Just because the criminal justice system says to someone, you should go to treatment, does not always mean that the treatment provider is providing the same level of coercion or understanding that leverage. Um, we need to work on improving the quality of supervision for clients who are involved in treatment programs. You've heard a lot of discussions this morning about prisons and jails. I implore you to look at the area of probation supervision. 80% of the offenders involved in the criminal justice system are on probation supervision. 30 to 80% of the entries into jail uh, or prison are from revocations from community supervisions. Improving the quality of supervisions for offenders in treatment will make a very large difference in outcomes, reductions in crime and reductions in drug use. And we can't forget that critical component. Related to that is this notion of sanctions. We've heard from um, Dr. Sattel this morning about leverage. Um, we have interest right now about sanctions. And sanctions are, in my perspective, a new way of supervision, of enforcing rules, of making offenders accountable, and, I might add, making the criminal justice system and public health system accountable. Um, I could tell you stories that I have seen in my research that would probably um, raise some eyebrows about, you know, discharges from treatment programs, um, no one really knowing this information not being shared. Therefore, there can't be an opportunity to penalize someone who is not fulfilling their treatment obligations. Um, sanctions are similar to the concept of behavior modifications. They are reinforcements of the message of accountability for the offender. 
as well as within other systems. Sanctions are the potential, and we've seen this in studies in Oregon and in South Carolina, where they apply graduated sanctions to reduce revocations and to reduce intakes into prisons, which have tremendous cost and benefit to society. And last um, is this notion of drug testing. Drug testing is a very valuable resource. What I am amazed is how little funding criminal justice and public health treatment agencies have for drug testing. I, um, in working with the state of Maryland most recently, they have reported that they spend about $250,000 on drug testing, 100,000 probationers and parolees. And that's all that they had within their capacity to um, do. Um, now, the state has put more money into drug testing as they have implemented a new program called Break the Cycle, which is modeled after some of the Break the Cycle programs that ONDCP um, and the Office of Justice programs have been sponsoring. Um, the critical part of drug testing is to tie it into managing the addict so you reduce their criminal behavior and their substance abuse. And the only way that can be done is if agencies have the ability to drug test, drug test clients and use that information as a way, as Dr. Sattel talked about, of keeping their commitment to treatment. Um, and so the whole issue of how we fund the drug testing becomes a critical component as we begin to think about these systems. Um, as part of that, I also think that there is a tremendous need to tie together the treatment systems and other systems in terms of sharing information and sharing data about clients that can be used to manage the risks of the substance abuser in the community. Um, and I, I think that there is, a t there is a need to begin to look at some of these technologies even more so. Um, in, in my brief time this morning, what I have tried to do is outline for you that this protocol of treatment, testing, sanctions, and criminal justice leverage can be that part of that silver bullet, I guess, if you want to add, to begin to really look at institutionalizing the benefits that we can get out of treatment. Related to that is the need to develop those performance measures. Um, my estimate is is that you know the, what we've seen in the Cal data studies and the RAND studies about the benefits of treatment. If we added the testing, if we added the monitoring and sanctions component with treatment, that we could almost um, triple the benefits that we get out of the treatment dollars that are spent today. In conclusion, I'd like to um, thank you for this opportunity to share with you some very exciting work and the, and the excitement of the field, actually, from what I hear of public health treatment programs as well as from criminal justice agencies with the realization that helping people resolve some of these long-term problems um, is feasible if given the proper resources to put some of these pieces in place. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Taxman. Uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Barrett, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the time. Uh, Mr. Hill, you talked about the need for, for testing in, in jails. And uh, a question for you which pertains to the question that I asked to the, earlier, the earlier panel. Um, do you think as we look at the pie, we should be putting taking resources out of other areas and putting them into treatment, or do you think this calls for additional resources for treatment? Well, I think my testimony suggested that uh, sometimes there's a misperception that when you say prisons, you mean jails, too. And I understand and the, the legislation that we often see doesn't include jails in the, in the system. I, uh, remembering your previous question, you asked if uh, we should be reducing the, uh, uh, the monies going into treatment. The answer is no. I'd certainly like to see that that pie divided up a little bit and, and see more going into to, uh, jail treatment programs because I think that they're, um, they have a, a, a real good uh, success rate. Are, are we the ones that tie your hands or do you find that you're stymied in getting funds more at the state level? Is it the language within the federal legislation when the money goes back to the states or is it the state policymakers who would rather put the money into the state prisons as opposed to jails? Jails are generally not mentioned. In the, in the legislation, and that's something that uh, we're calling to your attention that we need to do I'm that. I'm not aware of that. So specifically that's mention local jurisdictions uh, in, in any legislation. Okay, that's, that's helpful for me to, to know that, because I, I was under the impression that, that jails were 
uh, were eligible for the dollars, and I would agree with you that that might be a place where I, I'm right now not aware of any dollars okay. being available to jails. Dr. Lipton, you yeah, want they, to they are uh, the localities are specifically referred to in our set legislation. However, uh, the downside is the period of time which is required, which is uh, nine to twelve months treatment, whereas. Uh, uh, these gentlemen on my right are both asking for 90 days treatment, which would not be permissible under the current RSAT legislation. Okay. And does your suggestion that we that we include jails include a uh, component to that that there would be aftercare? Again, I think Dr. Lip, Lipton and, and Dr. Taxman both believe that that's something that's... I think everyone that's testified today agrees that we need aftercare. Um, absolutely, that should be part of any legislation aftercare and some kind of uh, measures of success if we can come to some agreement as to what uh, success of drug treatment programs are. Okay. Um, Mr. Pratt, in, in order for jail-based treatment to work, what systems must be in place to continue treatment and achieve optimal results? Well, it originates in the courts. Um, <clears throat> We persuaded the courts to send people into treatment for 90 days in Indianapolis and to mandate um, a follow-up, uh, namely probation. And um, <clears throat> later on, the success of this was uh, augmented by giving the GED to our people and job placement. Uh, so that now we have a, uh, a jail specifically for addicts. Uh, it's completely uh, used by community corrections for that purpose and the individuals get uh, three 90 days treatment and then go into a work release center and into probation. Uh, those are all things established now by under community corrections. Uh, I would add a word that the present legislation mandates at least six months treatment. The problem that the reason we need new legislation is that People aren't in jail six months. Uh, 90 days is much more the usual amount of time. And therefore, the new legislation wants to reduce for the jails from six months to 90-day treatment. That's one of its okay. primary uh, objectives. Thank you. Dr. Lipton. Uh, the average length of stay in, in jails, according to the AJA survey, uh, was 79 days for sentenced inmates which is obviously under 90. So what you need is not that you can't do treatment in that span of time. You can initiate treatment, and you can link an individual into continuing care in the community. And that seems to be, in my judgment, the most effective use of jail treatment, to start the program and then link it, but link it through the drug court pressure or other court pressure so that the individual is on a probation order that he must continue the treatment for a span of time subsequently. If you don't do that, you're wasting your resources because all of the evidence points to the fact that if you just do treatment up to the time of the release from prison, you will be, uh, you will have very, very little impact. Okay. And D Dr. Taxman, you want to add something? Yeah, I wanted to add something. I, you know, I think we all support the jail and in providing services in the jail. And as Dr. Lipton had mentioned, the question is, is what type of services and for how long? Um, we have, uh, as part of the HIDA project, we have a um, pilot in one area that has a lot of promise, particularly with these short time frames, which is this notion that you need to do treatment readiness. We make very co uh, common assumptions that just because you tell someone they need to go to treatment or you offer service, that people are prepared to, uh, to accept that service. And when I say prepared, to, I mean, in terms of their mental and physical capabilities. Um, there is a m new model of treatment right now called treatment readiness, which would work very well within a jail environment where you begin that preparation, the psychological and sociological preparation, and then through the continuous criminal justice leverage, give someone a guaranteed position in a community-based program outside. Now, what we have found in, within this one pilot program, which actually occurs in the Washington, D.C. area, is that most of the offenders needed residential substance abuse programs. They needed the structure. So the model that, um, the, that the Washington, D.C. is using as part of the HIDA program is this assessment orientation period for 30 days 
followed by 90 days in a residential treatment program, followed by another 90 days in an intensive outpatient program, and then aftercare after that. So they've really got a system in place to move the client and the leverage of the criminal justice system to retain that person. Just to follow up on that, as you are probably aware, there's been some criticism of the Baltimore, Washington, Haida because it does have a treatment component. Right. What, what's your best response to the critics who say that it's inappropriate to have a treatment component in the Haida? Well, I, I think my best response is to ask the critics to contact some of the local police chiefs um, that participate in the executive committee because I think one of the things that the lo those local police, and I, when I say local, I actually mean state, federal, and um, local police officers, um, would say is that they've understood what treatment is. When they came to the table, they didn't really understand that treatment is a demand reduction, and they didn't see the benefits that they could get out of treatment. But if you talk to um, Commissioner Fraser, who's the p um, police chief in Baltimore City, um, or if you talk to um, Chief John Farrell, who is the police chief in Prince George's County, um, or some of the U.S. attorneys, you will find that what they will tell you is they've understood that treatment can actually reduce the criminal behavior, and they rely upon that now as part of some of their strategy. So I, I, my first suggestion would be to talk to the, you know, the police chiefs. The second part is this understanding that most people came to the table thinking treatment is soft and feely and it just makes someone feel good. They didn't think about it as an outcome based, um, but our data and the retention and treatment kind of help people understand that there are benefits, particularly when they see the dip drug dealer who has a record of 25 prior arrests. Um, which means that they're on the street probably, tw you know, somewhere around 15 hours a day dealing drugs, and they're now actively involved in treatment programs within their communities and then helping younger kids. Um, and so, you know, part of this effort is really to understand that treatment isn't this soft and feely image that a lot of people have, but really has some meat to it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barrett. I'm becoming a little bit overwhelmed by statistics up here. Uh, I'm left with a little little unease with, with the statistics, and, and we see some from some of the other witnesses and some other studies. Uh, there's one study here, and I think one of the witnesses on the uh, first panel, uh, this was included in, in their testimony, that according to the DATOS, only around 5 to 10 percent of subjects in treatment stay in uh, the programs, uh, but yet one other figure that one of you all mentioned, I think, was 85 percent retention or whatnot, uh, and then I see some of the other testimony, uh, I think, in, included in, in your testimony, uh, Mr. Pratt, you talk about, uh, uh, and, and the, at the bottom of page four, and, and the, the copy that I have here is, is uh, pretty close to, to illegible. Uh, it's either 30 or 50 percent of 25 percent. Uh, that, that's talking about recidivism rate, and, and I know mixing apples and oranges is, is easy to do with all of these statistics, but I'm, I'm left with a little unease that uh, the, the, the percentage rate, and I'm, I'm not sure that it's really fair to characterize it as, you know, just because people aren't indicted within a year or something after they get out, that that's really a fair measure of success. Uh, so I'm a little bit, little bit concerned about, about that, and I don't know if we can resolve it today. There are just so many statistics uh, uh, floating around, but maybe if you all could take, maybe Dr. Taxman and Dr. Lipton, maybe. Uh, I mean, what, what, what are the actual figures? Uh, if there, is there any way of telling how successful these programs are? There are about five national studies that have been conducted over the last 25, 30 years. And there's been a general you level of consistency. There's mic. been a general level of consistency uh, with respect to the positive outcomes. And these are the kinds of outcomes that the National Institute on Drug Abuse has been talking about over the years. The differences that you're hearing are in part because we've been talking about criminal justice-based programs done in prison, which have much higher retention rates 
than programs done in the community where there is no compulsion for an individual to stay in a program. Uh, when an individual volunteers for treatment, uh, they can turn around and walk out if they're in the community and not under any criminal justice leverage. And that perhaps underscores Dr. Sattel's point about the use of leverage. Uh, do these programs work? Uh, and the, the question has to be asked in a framework of with what kinds of drugs, with what kind of people, over what span of time, and there are obviously uh, a whole series of dimensions which we would need to attend to. And uh, what we do know is that we have more success with heroin users using methadone program, for example, than we have with, for heroin users using any other method. Uh, we, do, we do know that outpatient programs do not produce the same level of outcome with very serious drug users that therapeutic communities do. And as we begin to look at subsets of the population, we see different kinds of outcomes, which accounts perhaps for some of the confusion that relates to differences in rates. But generally, the rates that are for each subgroup tend to be fairly consistent over time. And uh, the results are that if you have no coercion, no leverage, an individual simply volunteers, walks into treatment, and he's out in the community, uh, you have very low retention. And very and I, low. So, and, and would that also make the, the, the figures themselves suspect if you're basically talking about you know, self-reporting, you're relying on that amount If you're, if you're talking only about self-reporting. But the, a history of being truthful. But the correctional drug abuse studies are all using uh, biological specimens for determination as to their effectiveness. It's not simply self-reporting. Okay. Uh, Dr. Taxman, and if you could also may maybe, maybe address briefly the question of funding. I mean, uh, you all make a, a case for uh, testing and treatment. The federal government does, in fact, provide substantial sums of money. Uh, the difficulty that we run into sometimes is, is trying to figure out exactly where that money is being used. Uh, $3.2 billion is, is a lot of money, at least by the standards of my constituents and probably most citizens in our country. Uh, yet of that $3.2 billion, uh, we, have, we have a very difficult time figuring out exactly where it's being used. and, and perhaps some questions that, that we may have for, for some other panels, including perhaps some folks from, from HHS, uh, would be where exactly is this money used, being used? Uh, uh, if we only have uh, a small number of, of programs, uh, where is the rest of it being used? So we're having somewhat of a difficulty from our standpoint tracking this money from, from an oversight perspective, and you, you all may have some, uh, some you know, questions about that as well. Dr. Taxman? Yes. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to sort of go back and a clarify one point. I think when Dr. I think it was Dr. Sattel gave a, a retention rate issue of 20 percent, she was talking about the volunteer rates. And if you look at the studies on program completion, which are not self-report, they're program data from the programs themselves, um, they are very low for the volunteers that Dr. Lipton talked about. Um, but in average, the retention rates are about 50 percent with criminal justice clients doing better if you look at program data records. This leads to the, the question that you've asked more directly, which has to do about funding and your difficulty of trying to find out how many programs are out there. Um, and, you know, having asked the same questions, I think part of the issue is, is that the majority of funds are block grant dollars that are given to states. And the states then give them to the localities to put in place programs. Unfortunately, as was noted, um, there used to be a client data system that used to be in existence. I think that's only about a third of the 3.2 billion. So that still leaves sort of 2.2 billion out there that we can't really figure out where it goes to. Yeah, well, they're, they're discretionary programs that come out of some of the OJP programs and some of the other um, grant-funded The only CSAC. point is that and it's not really critical of you all. Maybe you can, you all can help us uh, uh, try and track where this money is. I mean, there's a substantial amount of money that, that's been appropriated out there for the precisely the kind of programs that you all are advocating. 
Well, and, and I think that if you look, I can only speak because I've looked at how the block grants funnel through a couple different states, is sometimes the funds do get used for administrative costs instead of going directly into programs. Uh, my own concern about the block grants and even some of these discretionary grants is having a reporting system in place that deals with program retention rates so that you can use that to really gauge program, um, you know, performance measures about programs. Um, but I think, you know, some surveys of different states that would basically begin to ask what treatment programs are out there and who funds them. Most of these programs have multiple funding sources. Um, and so they're very, they're always trying to scramble to get programs. Um, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barrett, would you have any objection? I just have a couple of uh, follow-up questions. Uh, Mr. Hill, uh, I guess I'd direct this to you because of your particular background, but uh, maybe Mr. Pratt also. Uh, most inmates, either in jails or prisons, are there pursuant to state criminal offenses, not federal. Uh, are you aware of, of any law of any state that prohibits by law uh, drug testing of inmates at jails or uh, prison facilities, uh, or any state that prohibits uh, drug treatment? None that I'm aware of, no. Uh, I, I, I don't think that there are, and therefore it seems that really the the primary focus uh, really ought to be with, with, with state officials. And in your experience, where does the opposition to these sorts of programs at the state level come from, uh, the use, of, the use of, of, of monies for testing and treatment? Is, is it essentially a fiscal objection? Uh, is it uh, a lack of interest on the parts of state governments to tackle this problem and provide for uh, drug treatment and testing at state facilities or county facilities? Where, where is the main problem? Are you speaking in terms of federal funding? No, state. Since, state since, funding? Since the primary problem, really, given the number of inmates being primarily those who have committed state offenses and are, and are in state or some county holding facilities, uh, it seems to me that the first place we ought to look to address the problem of why aren't there more treatment programs should be state governments. And is, the, is there something we need to be aware of why state governments are, are opposing or don't seem to be addressing the problem? I would believe that it's a matter of dollars, that uh, they simply don't believe that they have the number of dollars. In, in Pennsylvania, uh, currently uh, most county jails, are, their populations are about 28 to 30 percent state prisoners, those who uh, could be serving their time in, in state prisons, and we're not receiving funding for that. So I, I don't see the, the the impetus coming from the states to uh, to fund localities. I don't think we're seeing that in in government today. And and no matter how much we do at the federal government, uh, there, there's only so much of a problem that we that we could tackle. Well, we call the the, the feds uh, Uncle Sugar. You know, he's got all the money. Uh, we tax everybody, and the states come in and try to get some of that money. So we look to the big daddy to give us the money, I guess. Well, I, I, I understand what you're saying, and I know you're only being partially facetious, but uh, the fact of the matter is that this really is primarily a problem that ought to be tackled by the states, and, and I don't, I'm not aware whether there are groups out there that are really addressing this at the state level. That would be very helpful to us at the federal level, since this should not be the, fa the tail wagging the dog. Uh, this might be a, an area where a great deal more focus by advocates such as yourself and experts such as yourself could be of help uh, in urging state legislators to, uh, to address this issue. Mr. Pratt, did you have any thoughts on that uh, before I uh, ask Mr. Barrett if he has any additional questions? <clears throat> well, one of the things that have influenced that, of course, is the, um, <clears throat> um, the provision of the funding for drug alcohol treatment in uh, the 1994 Act that uh, allowed the states to uh, give treatment in the state penitentiaries. And 15 percent of that money was to have gone for the county jails. And uh, because of the factor we discussed earlier, that uh, uh, they mandated a six months treatment, um, the county jails didn't get the money. And um, we found it very difficult uh, in Indianapolis to get money for uh, random drug uh, treatment. We're still battling that battle. A very good use of the funding. Uh, I conclude, too, by saying that uh, your question about the validity of the effectiveness of this treatment 
needs to be clarified. Our five studies show an average 54 percent people not coming back to jail two years after uh, treatment. That's a very hard figure. The reason I say that uh, about 25 percent has to be subtracted from that figure to be really accurate is because <clears throat> the Department of Justice show that 25 percent of all persons do not come back to prison at all. Uh, you're, you're getting <laughs> a 25 percent, you might say, natural cut in recidivism. So the most we can attribute to uh, the effectiveness of this program is about 25 to 27 percent. But as Dr. Lipton said earlier, the greatest figures in the reduction of crime that we know about. And, and uh, another audience to which you might address those particular points in addition to state governments uh, is the Secretary of Health and uh, of HHS because uh, they're the ones that have, uh, that have control over uh, the, the lion's share of, uh, uh, of our uh, 3.2 billion which was uh, appropriated uh, in the current fiscal year. Uh, so that, uh, that really ought to be another audience, not just those of us up here. We can't micromanage, or at least we don't want to, to be in the position of micromanaging HHS or any of the other departments. Uh, but uh, if you all, again, as experts, can bring that to bear in the department and help uh, us direct those monies to these sorts of programs, we might see more of an impact. Let me just ask uh, Mr. Barrett if he had any uh, couple final questions, question. if I may. Uh, I've talked a lot today or made reference to the problem of resource allocation. And one of the things that this Congress has done is uh, pass legislation that sends money back to the states for prison construction, um, something that is very popular, obviously, among, among people who feel that people who commit crime should be locked up for long periods of time. Uh, my question for each of you is, would you support, and there's legislation pending, would you support or do you think it's a good idea um, to allow the states to use some of that money uh, for drug treatment, which would mean they would not be using it for prison construction, but it would instead be used for drug treatment in prisons or in jails, obviously something that some of you favor. Would that be something that you think would be prudent? Mr. Hill? I think it would be prudent if we put some caveats on it that uh, we, we want to know that the treatment is effective. We want to agree on uh, what are the measures of success. I, I don't I think I've heard any agreement on what the measure of success is to any of the programs. But I don't think we should be uh, investing any money into a program unless we know what the outcomes should be and that we have some clear measures of that so that we know we're getting the bang for our bucks. Okay. Mr. Pratt. About a year ago, <clears throat> I went to both uh, members of the House and the Senate uh, with a very similar request to the one that you're considering. And um, I got very uh, negative results. And um, I fell back upon the promotion of the legislation I described where we would use a percentage of the state funding uh, in the 1994 Act for the county jails. It mandates 10% of that. And that was about the best uh, response I could get uh, from the Senate and the House. Um, Dr. Lipton? Okay. Uh, yes, the answer I give you is the un unequivocal testing, sanctions, and treatment, use of that money uh, clearly is, is, is necessary and needed. However, the real important caveat is that if we apply treatment on a much broader scale, we are going to run out of trained people like that. And if we start doing treatment with untrained people, our success rates, which we've been talking about, are going to go like that. So uh, we need to couple the investment in treatment, uh, however, out of whatever source it, source it may come, with uh, improved uh, training, scholarships, internships, uh, programs that would sponsor forensic psychology departments to produce trained individuals for these kinds of programs. Okay, I understand. Dr. Taxman? 
Um, I agree with Dr. Lipton, unequivocally yes. Um, and I would also hope that you would uh, think about imposing or using some of the RSAT criteria in terms of having time frames for these programs because I think that's very beneficial to get the types of outcomes that everyone desires. Um, but uh, loosening those in the sense that you could pay for some of the services in the community so we can put in place these systems of care and also using that for the supervision component. That is one part, um, although I, you know, I understand Mr. Bear's point that this is not typically a federal responsibility, um, it is state and local responsibilities, it is an area in which there is a real need to focus in because we can't supervise um, offenders in treatment when you have a probation agent that has 200 you know, offenders on their caseload. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, thank the distinguished ranking member and I'd like to thank the members of the panel. Uh, we do need to conclude. Uh, if there is additional material, uh, I fully anticipate that we will be holding additional uh, hearings on these matters. Uh, and if there are additional materials you would like us to consider or additional questions that you believe we ought to be posing to, to other witnesses, uh, for example, with government agencies, uh, please submit that, uh, that material. Uh, to, uh, to the subcommittee chair, uh, Mr. Hastert. And uh, again, uh, whatever materials you all have submitted today will be included in full in the record. We appreciate very much your time uh, and expertise. We are hereby adjourned. Next, President Clinton signs into law a bill that restructures the Internal Revenue Service, changing the tax agency's oversight and operations. Then a Senate panel examines government policies on retirement income